Welcome back to E3 Day 3. Welcome to Day 3. So, we're starting a little late. There's a couple things on E3 that happened which didn't look too interesting, and we're going to do a cover, kind of a recap of those. That way we're not spending all the time watching E3's commentary, and we can just dive into what's actually the good stuff. Uh, the first thing we're going to tackle is actually what is kind of still happening right now, but also what just happened, which was in television's Amica console debut. Now, if you're under 30, you probably don't know about Intellivision. Uh, <laughs> I barely know them. Like, I recognize them as a name, but I did not grow up with them. Neither did I. I it's, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so what they just did was create a console that is a way to play old games with your friends. So, first, let's just let's play the trailer. So, t so we brought up a little uh, quick trailer for it. So let's go ahead and run this, and you can take a look at it, and then we'll just give you some thoughts, because I'm really curious to hear if this would interest you at all, because it, it, I feel like we're the target demographic, and we're not even sure we want to buy this. So let's go ahead and run this. All right, we had a few technical difficulties there. We're gonna play the we're gonna play that one more time with working audio, and then we'll talk about it. Go ahead. Hi, my name's Tommy Tellerico, and I'm the CEO of Intellivision, and we are so excited to be a part of this year's all virtual E3 because we're launching a brand new retro-inspired video game console called Intellivision Amico, which features very simple and easy pick up and play games, no matter what your skill level, but focuses mainly on multiplayer couch co-op. Check it out. Our controllers have simple to use color capacitive touchscreens, and we're going to be featuring this and a whole lot more this year at E3, Monday, June 14th, at 12.45 p.m. Eastern and 9.45 a.m. Pacific. Hope to see you there. So the Intellivision Amico, uh, yeah, Amico. I wanna say Amica for some reason. Uh, it is almost exactly what we've been talking about. So we really like uh, Couch Co-op. Mm -hmm. And there's been a big emphasis on just co-op and some couch co-op games on E3 this year. Uh, we have families with young kids. And I play games with mine. Like, my kids love playing Totally Reliable Delivery Service, uh, Moving Out, uh, Overcooked. Like, couch co-op family games they, they love. And this system is specifically designed for family and friends who want to play couch co-op games. And it doesn't look interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Which is sadly disappointing, because I'm sure they put a lot of work into it. I feel like they're also trying to play a little bit more on the nostalgia factor with, uh, with the font that they had there. Uh, just a little design thing that I noticed. It's like a bold Disney font, almost. Or Disney-esque font. Yeah, he even said it in like the introduction of the console. It is a retro console. 
So it is designed to play old art, uh, you know, old, old games. So you've got Atari and television games. They have license deals with uh, Hot Wheels, the MLB for some like old school baseball and soccer games. So there's a lot of games on there. And the idea, I think, I don't know if it's the presentation of it or if it's the idea itself. The idea of actually having a dedicated system to only play couch co-op games in this day and age seems a little silly. It's a little I, too limited. It is quite limited. Like I think they had a few 3D games, but it's gonna it's super, super basic. Most of them are gonna be 2D. And so I just don't know. Hmm. I I think I might try it out. But at the same time, if the, so, the pricing is going to be the biggest deal here. Yes. If this sure. thing's more than fifty bucks, I'm not going to buy it. There's not a chance. Nope. There's already too many games that we play that we enjoy, and there's so many games coming out that actually look like they have like really great family and couch co-op value. That why would I buy an entire system for it? It's a really really hard sell. They they are doing some things right. Like in the E3 presentation, they say. If you take a controller, because you know it's got two controllers on the base. If you right. take a controller to a friend's house, then you put it in their dock. Then you, then your friend, while you're there, can play all the games you own. It's super simple. It's intuitive. That's exactly what it should be like. If you could do that with an Xbox controller or a PlayStation controller, that'd be amazing. Instead of having to lug your controller over or have to log into your credentials, like yeah, that'd be great. But I just I'm not sold on this. And I feel like I am the audience for it, so I'm I'm really concerned that this is going to be dead in the water, just straight up dead in the water. So, yeah. I don't know why, but in some ways it also kind of reminds me of, uh, did you ever get this as a kid? I got this a few Christmases uh, when I was younger, where it's like, you get this game controller that it says like, oh, it's got all these games right here, and it plugs into your TV, like with <laughs> RCA cables. And nope. it's like, it's, you got like a hundred games, but they're all like really low quality, not so great games. It kind of reminds me of that. However, that it has, you know, nostalgic games on there that actually yeah. did well in their, in their heyday. So yeah, the, the games here look of a higher quality, but it reeks of that same thing. Like you can buy them nowadays. I had a friend who bought like a rip off Nintendo once like, Hey, 500 games in this console. Mm -hmm. And there's not a single one that's worth playing. <laughs> <laughs> the quantity does not make up for the lack of quality. Right. So that's kind of... Uh, it feels that way, and yet I know it isn't, because it, they actually look like good games. They have names that I actually recognize, mm -hmm. and yet at the same time, it feels just like a terrible investment. But Future Game Show was yesterday, and they actually announced a lot of new trailers. So we've compiled a list of the best trailers that we're going to go through... That way you don't have to sit through a ton of commentary. The first one, which was really interesting, they talked about it at uh, E3 proper, and then the after show, they showed more of it, was Lemnisgate. Yes. I mentioned that when I saw it. It looked super interesting. So we're going to take a look at Lemnisgate, and this is an actual like gameplay breakdown of how a match works. And this game has couch co-op, which is cool. So let's go ahead and... Check this out, because this game is definitely on my two playlist. Yeah, so this is the turn Hi, I'm James Anderson, like first from person Russian strategy Canada. shooter. We're an indie studio based out of Montreal, Canada, and I'm the game director currently working on Lemnus Gate. You might have seen our reveal trailer on opening night live, but uh, today we're here and very excited to share more details with you. So Lemnus Gate is a turn-based strategy first-person shooter where each character on your team is controlled by you. So how this works is the whole game is set inside of a 25 second time loop and different players take turns adding characters into that time loop. So for example, I'll play a turn for 25 seconds. Every single action I did in that 25 seconds will repeat over and over until the end of the match. Then the opponent does the same thing and plays for 25 seconds. So now there'll be two characters looping in the same 25 second period. 
So then we take turns going back and forth, adding more and more characters into the same 25 second it's time loop until idea. the end of the 10th round, where there'll be five of me and five of you all looping over the yeah. same 25 seconds. So if I could summarize how it feels time, or how it plays, how it's kind of like chess meets like first person shooter. It's really a game where strategy is just as important replicate. as skill. And in because order to survive, you'll need keen observation skills, and careful planning, player. and mm -hmm. some skillful execution. And then just putting it on a loop. It's, it's so here we're looking at some exclusive footage. It's taken in one of our but worlds called the Arbor. So in Lemniscate, all of our different maps just, take place on different worlds spanning the entire galaxy, which creates a great variety of it's, location as you play. It's we're super currently fun watching idea, a one versus one game, like, but we do support 1v1 man, and 2v2 having, like, online. Your, and what's really cool about Lemniscate uh, is as a side like effect of your, being a turn-based shooter, you can actually like play the, the local multiplayer aspect, I guess, using path to controller setup. It's so interesting because it's like... What we're seeing right now is a local game just so responding to, to what the, the other player did on their previous turn the and then the other player not being able to change what they're doing so you might have noticed a little drone flying guy to respond to we what call you this did our such an interesting mode. concept so like before be you really take your fun. time you can yeah, freely move the camera around the entire map the and you'll see that the time loops playing out underneath you so you have full visibility all the characters and all the actions that have taken place so far in the game are fully visible to you Another cool feature in Lemniscape is what we call Ghost Mode. So in Lemniscape, if you die, death is not final. You keep playing for the remainder of the 25 second round. This is because you can go back in time on the next round and save your previous character from dying and any actions that you took as a ghost will become a reality in a oh, new timeline. Okay. Lemniscate is coming to PC, PlayStation 4 and Xbox One in early 2021. We'll be sharing much more information closer to that time. But right now, you can wishlist us on Steam to stay up to date with current news and announcements. So thanks a lot for watching, and we really hope you enjoy the rest of the show. Yeah, so Tyrion, bring up the wishlist page on Steam, because what's really nice is this game is actually only 20 bucks. Yeah, that was the other nice thing. It's not very expensive and it looks really really fun they mentioned they've got 1v1 couch co-op because you just pass the controller mm -hmm. because you're just you're just playing and you doesn't there's no hidden information right and then they have 2v2 which could get real wild because i think you play five turns which so that means there's going to be basically 20 characters running around at the end at 2v2 which so this idea is just it's awesome it's very awesome it, and like you were saying, while it was uh, playing, we're, I mean, I think we're all in agreement. We're surprised that this hasn't been done yet. I, I, there are aspects of this, like, Braid is a game that came, comes to mind, which is an indie game that used time travel, where you would solve puzzles, and when you completed one, you could, like, reverse the time with that puzzle completed, and then you can go on. Oh, interesting. And so this is, reminds me of that, because, like, the idea of using time travel in games is obviously very popular. There's even quite a few games this year specifically that use time loops. Mm -hmm. Now, this is not a time loop. This is, well, I guess it is a time loop, but it's a loop that you're interacting with and changing in a unique way. So, Aaron, it looks like it's on sale until August 3rd, so it's only fifteen ninety nine right now. Oh, wow. fifteen ninety nine, folks. For pre-orders. So, so if you pre-order it... and. There's a lot of debate around pre-orders that it's not great. Here, I would, I would say that this kind of pre-order is totally fine. This, this looks like a much smaller team, mm -hmm. and they've shown real gameplay. And if you want to support it, then mm -hmm. I think pre-ordering makes total sense. This is a game that I'm really looking forward to playing, and I'm definitely going to check it out. Same here. So Lemnusgate is a big standout from yesterday's showing. Okay, it also looks like... August 3rd is the launch date. Yeah. So until launch date, it's 15.99. Okay, so you've got about a month and a half to pick it up on sale. So if this looks up your alley at all, then you should definitely check it out. Next up, we're going to take a look at a game called Hidden Deep. This looks like well, Let's just watch the trailer and find out. It looks really interesting. It's a 2D game. I kind of wanted to highlight some of the more uh, interesting 2D games because that's something you can easily... That's what, that's what Game Maker Studio is made for. That's what you learn in this book. That's what I teach primarily. 
And so I really want to highlight those more indie games that sometimes are made by really small teams or even a solo person, which we're going to look at later, a game called Axiom Verge. But this looks really fun, kind of a horror game, which could be pretty interesting to play in a group because it's actually a co-op game or kind of a co-op kind game. Of a co-op. So go ahead and play. Let's look at Hidden Deep. So it's giving off big thing vibes, the movie, if you've ever seen it. It's, it's pulling directly from that scene where they get its arms cut off or chop, eaten off. But it looks really interesting. I don't know how they would implement a conspiracy, trusting no one vibe on local couch co-op. Yeah, I'm not sure either. Because they had split screen there, but maybe the split screen was just showing like when you're controlling two different players. I'm not totally sure on that. But a 2D game with co-op and some horror elements sounds really interesting and fun, and that I don't think we it, it's I don't think it's going to replace Among Us. No. But I definitely get that vibe. I do too. They're building on that like, oh hey, this is a co-op game, but you can't trust people and you can kill others. But how to deceive others if it's like a couch co-op? Yeah, yeah I don't know. I'm I if they do it well, I'm sure they can make it work. There are things that you can implement, like controller vibration that someone else can't see or feel. That's the only thing I was thinking, is that's yeah. probably the only way they would be able to do it. Yeah. I mean, you can implement like a Morse code where like if it, tri- if it vibrates three times, then you're like a traitor or some. I don't know. I have no idea how that would work. I mean, Among Us, you obviously can't play in the same TV. If it had split screen, that wouldn't work. So, I'm curious. All right. Uh, coming up next on E3 is the Take Two interactive panel. It looks like that might be running now. If they actually have anything interesting, we'll cut away to that. Uh, Take Two is a developer, makes some good games, but as an interactive panel, they're just talking about games, and I would like to continue showing more games. So let's go ahead and jump to Axiom Verge 2. So Axiom Verge is a old school retro game inspired by like classic Metroid, Castlevania, games like that. But what's really cool about it is Axiom Verge was made by a single developer for everything. Wow. Art, code, music, sound effects. He did it all. Wow. Kudos to you, dude, whoever you are. Yeah. So it was a a well-received game, and it did well, and now he's got a sequel coming out. So I really want to highlight this because I I think being able to make a game completely on your own... That's a huge achievement. It is. And you can learn to do that here. So let's go ahead and jump to Axiom Verge 2. Hello, I'm Tom Happ, and I'm here to tell you a little bit about my upcoming game, Axiom Verge 2. But first, a quick trip down memory lane. For anyone not familiar with the first Axiom Verge, here's a very brief synopsis. The story was a sci-fi adventure in which you play as Trace, a scientist who winds up in the world of Sudra. His mind is preserved by machines, and every time he dies, his memories are transferred into a new, cloned body. It's a love letter to some of my favorite games growing up, including Metroid, Blaster Master, Contra, and many more. When I crafted the story, I made sure to think deeply about the entire universe of Axiom Verge. 
How did it come to be? How is it related to our world? I ultimately decided to break the full story of the Axiom Verge universe into multiple parts with multiple perspectives, each intended to be its own game. And now, the next chapter is ready to be revealed. I don't want to spoil things too much, but most of Axiom Verge 2 is set before the events of Axiom Verge 1, but they are each standalone complementary experiences, so you can play them in either order. In Axiom Verge 2, you play as Indra, the mysterious billionaire behind the worldwide Globe 3 conglomerate. Hiding in Antarctica is what appears to be an ancient, alternate Earth, complete with mountains, lakes, deserts, and the ruins of a civilization. But you get the feeling that something else is lurking just past the fringes of reality, waiting to pull you in. Although Axiom Verge 1 and 2 flush out different parts of the same overall universe, their mechanics are quite different. The games share the same DNA, and fans of the first game will definitely feel right at home in this one. But make no mistake, this isn't just an iteration of the gameplay you saw in the first game. It is a complementary piece of the overall puzzle that is Axiom Verge. Now, it would be customary in a developer commentary to go into lots of detail about all the new and different mechanics and introduce new enemy types, bosses, and weapons, but I'm really hoping to avoid spoilers here. Even mentioning that there are spoilers is itself a spoiler. But one thing that has not changed is that there are tons of hidden areas for you to explore and mysteries to find. So if you really like the feeling of figuring out deeply hidden secrets, I think you'll love Axiom Verge 2. Be sure to keep an eye out for Axiom Verge 2 when it launches on the Epic Games Store and Nintendo Switch this spring. So that's coming up pretty soon, and it looks really good. It does. It's a really pretty game. Now, sometimes you get into game development in lots of different ways. Sometimes there are artists that want to make games, and so they learn to code. Sometimes there are coders who want to make games, and then they have to learn how to do some art and music. It all depends on... The original field you were in is doesn't determine what you can do, but it does kind of complement and usually showcases this, the, what you're going to highlight with your game. Yeah. To me, this guy, uh, Tom Hop, right? What was his name? Yeah, it was Tom. It looked like he was an artist first. Like those sketches he did, mm -hmm. they were great. And they, he had books of sketches. And so I get the impression that he was an artist first and wanted to make a game. And so he learned to code and then do everything else. Yeah. And that's totally fine. I'm definitely the other way around. I am not an artist, but I am a programmer. Uh, so that's something that I struggle with. So my games tend to focus more on the mechanics and the technical side of it, that what you can do. Mm -hmm. Some games are very pretty and are kind of more shallow on gameplay. And that's right. okay. Every, all the games are different. So next up I want to take a look at a game which does look absolutely gorgeous. It's called Savior. And this looks to me like this was an artist or a group of artists that really had an idea for a game and spent a lot of time making it beautiful. It also looks really interesting from a gameplay perspective. They have a very unique mechanic in there to make the combat uh, unlike other 2D combat, but it also looks gorgeous. So we're going to take a look at Savior and enjoy this view. Hi, I'm Weston, the director of the upcoming action-adventure game, Savior. In Savior, you play as Sam, a stranger with no possessions and no memory. As you explore, you'll discover your origin and your place among the characters you meet. You'll have to either battle, evade, or persuade your opponents into joining you in order to rebuild the broken world of Arcadia. At its core, there are three things that make Savior special. First is the combat system. It was inspired by playing years of Punch-Out on the NES. So you and many of your opponents have the ability to strike, dodge, and parry, which adds realistic strategy not really found in the genre. Opponents strike fast, but they all telegraph their strikes, so you'll learn their attack patterns and surely best them over time. 
The early enemies don't block so well, so you can kind of button mash your way through. But as you progress, you'll need to watch for telegraphs and time your dodges, blocks, and counters carefully. Things get dicier when two opponents attack at once. They'll always try to surround you, and it's best not to let them. Next is movement. Sam runs and jumps like many other 2D action game characters, but she does much more. With our addition of parkour, especially the ledge grab, she bounds through the terrain with a unique and satisfying fluidity. The dozens of animations and movement commands make movement a standout feature. Just running around is fun. Arcadia is a land divided. The Chosen have lived under the rule of their deity for a thousand years. They are led by the laws of the Creed, which dictates all areas of Arcadian life, especially the punishment for doubt or challenge. Any who oppose the Creed are banished and dropped into the depths of the planet. They are known as the Fallen. But the Fallen survived their banishment. They explored their underground home where they thrived. But the Chosen and the Fallen have been divided too long. It's up to you to reunite them. All of us at Starsoft are working tirelessly to bring the Savior to Steam and Nintendo Switch in winter of 2022. We hope you'll add Savior to your wish list on Steam, sign up for our newsletter, or follow us on social media to stay up to date on our progress. Thank you. So unfortunately the game is a year and a half away still, but Dang, that what, looks beautiful. Yeah, from what we have seen, it is very pretty. It is, yeah. It, like, we were just saying that if it if it actually plays as well as it looks, because trailers can be very deceiving. Yeah. Even from indie developers, which is what I, the impression I get, this is a very small studio. And again, I think they were artists first, because the game is just gorgeous. They spent a lot of time creating, what they said, like 30 different animations for running around and jumping. Mm -hmm. That's... That's a level of detail that you don't see very often. No. But it looks great. And the combat system sounds amazing. Um, I enjoy really in-depth, difficult combat because I like Souls games. I like a challenge. Being able to just run and gun and destroy everything is kind of boring to me. It's more like a dungeon crawler thing, I feel like. Yeah. Yeah. It, I, I, just, I don't mesh with the easy-to-kill enemies. The so, combat in it kind of in a way reminded me of like the arkham games or like shadow of mordor mm -hmm. oh yeah the like counter and uh <clears throat> yeah if you saw for honor system. that's what it reminded me of directly like for honor and there, i think there was another chivalry right Sh they, they showed chivalry earlier where when you're fighting you actually choose which like direction to block and mm -hmm. you choose a direction to attack and then you have to block and it's it's very specific and it's it's requires a lot more skill but in but this is scaling it into a 2D version. Yeah, 2D version with a D-pad and A and B. He said he was inspired by Punch-Out. You play Punch-Out? Never played Punch-Out. Super Punch-Out is a great game. Oh, I didn't play much of the original, but I played Super Punch-Out a ton. That's on the SNES, and that was a great game. And I can see how you can get inspired by that to make more. All right, next up, let's take a look at Ember. So... I'm going to do a little bit of research during this because I'm pretty sure I know who the developer is. I didn't see him, but I think it's the same people who make most of the games my kids play because it has the exact same art style and the same silliness factor. But this looks like a really fun couch co-op, family-oriented game. So let's go ahead and take a look at Ember. Are you ready to join the gig economy? Become your own boss. As a firefighter, food delivery person, or a courier, Ember hits consoles with cross-play functionality for up to four players. Rescue together Escape together Deliver together Boss fight together. And salvage together. Risking your life for money has never been more rewarding.
Ember, launching summer 2021. Firefighter, can you imagine? <laughs> so, Ember is not made by Team 17, that's who I was thinking about, but it has the exact same feel of games like Overcooked, Moving Out, Totally Reliable Delivery Service. Uh, it looks like it's kind of physics-based, very silly, uh, irreverent humor. See, and I think it's it's funny how they took something that's a very normal thing in this day and age, which is the gig economy, where it talked about food delivery person, <laughs> courier, and then there's like a rating scale for how well you do. I, I it's that's hilarious. I'm surprised that that hasn't been made into a game already. Now, and I hopefully. Firefighters did not become a gig economy. No, hopefully not. That would not be ideal. No, no it wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> but that looks like it could be quite a bit of fun. Um, I, I think that's probably one that my kids are going to play. Uh, if that comes to Games Pass or if they see it, at least try it. Right? They're going to buy it and they're going to love it. I'm sure. So uh, there's an, so up next we're going to take a look at War. Hospital. Now, this game actually looks really interesting as well. So, let's go ahead and play this and then we'll talk about it because this has some unique elements that I wanted to highlight. So, Tyrion, bring up War Hospital. The Great War didn't start as something we were worried about. We had no idea how it would change when they sent us directly to the front line into the chaos. And then in the mud and drama of trench death, we learned how to survive. And how to choose between life and death. Because every saved life counts. <laughs> so uh, apparently this wasn't uh, the game we were initially thinking however um, this game I, I find quite interesting uh, it's from a time era that I like studying which is World War I as soon as they mentioned Great War I was like oh cool there's another one of these because there's not very many World War I games uh, there was, I think, one called like Versailles 1917 or something like that, and then obviously there's Battlefield 1, which did uh, phenomenal for it being a first-person shooter from that time era. So uh, seeing another game come out, even though it's not you know, quite like any of those, I think it's still really cool. Yeah, there's, there's some times in history that are really popular, and that some that aren't. Yes. World War II is super popular. Yeah. And World War One is a lot less popular. A lot Vietnam less. is even less popular. Yeah, I think I've only ever seen one <laughs> Vietnam uh, game, but there's a lot of uh, stuff with that. So, Tyrion, bring up Fire Commander. So this leads right. Uh, it kind of it has nothing to do with Ember, the other trailer we just watched. But this is an example, in my opinion, of a really, really good trailer, but it shows no gameplay. So, well, actually, I guess like it might show, like, a second of gameplay. But this is a really interesting trailer that makes you, uh, I think, get... Oh, man, what's the word I'm looking for? I don't know. Let's watch it and tell me what you think. Because I think this trailer is actually really, really well done for not having any gameplay. Let's go ahead. So there's a few seconds of gameplay that you can see there, very little. But that trailer, I think, is just so good. Yeah, and I love how it shows like the temperature of you know like sweat or water boiling. 
uh, things like that. You don't really see any firefighting games that actually look legit, like that aren't like silly looking. Yeah. Like that's really cool. I played a firefighting board game. I can't remember what it was called, but it was really fun too. And this looks really interesting. It looks like it's a kind of a tactical game, mm-hmm. kind of like XCOM, except that you're fighting fires and trying to survive. But that build up from the human body temperature to 1100 degrees, and it's like that's where we come in. It's just, it's just, it's really cool. I like that, and I'd be really interested to also see if they're getting funding from fire, like from the fire department or from the government for something like this. I. I hesitate to say that it would be like a propaganda game. I don't think firefighters are very controversial in this day and age, uh, unlike other departments of our government. Uh, but firefighters are not like yeah, like you could say we don't see very much of them. No, not not in video games. Let not alone in games, in no. Even huge blockbuster movies. I think there's only like two that I can think of. Yeah, there's very few. So I think that's a great idea for a game, and it could be really interesting. Next up, we're gonna bring up. Kina, Bridge of Spirits. This looks like a lot of fun. This reminds me, like th- this looks exactly like uh, Raya and the Last Dragon, like the animation style. Oh, it looks like it's almost that animation style just in video game form. Okay. It has nothing to do with it. It's not associated with Disney in the slightest, but that's just what it reminds me of. So here's Kina, Bridge of Spirits. I know you are kind. You sense the power that flows through this land. Yet, you do not fully understand it. Yeah, so this game looks like an animated movie that mm-hmm. you get to play. And it looks like a kind of a fun game, too, which I think is important. <laughs> but it's also very pretty. Very pretty. And just, yeah, it looks great. So we have, uh, I'll put a link actually in the chat, and we're going to scroll through this as well together. So Windows Central and probably some other places compiled a list of all of the trailers that came out of the future game showcase and there was a surprising amount of trailers i think there's a couple dozen here and some of them we've already seen but for the most part all the ones we just watched were relatively new and pretty good so go Tyrion, go ahead and bring this up and let's just scroll through so there's a lot of games announced so we've got shadow tactics blades of the shogun which is an expansion uh to a tactics game hidden deep which we, we looked already at looked at. We've got Glitch Punk, uh, which is like a top-down game inspired by Grand Theft Auto. 
sounds a little interesting. If you want to look at any of these, let me know. Then we've got Life of Delta. So here's a point and click adventure, something you really don't see very often. Like they exist. This one looks like it's all about robots. It's in a post-apocalyptic future. It looks kind of cute. Could be Finnish. Now, here's one that, okay, let's take a look at this. Tyrion, let's bring up Fling to the Finish. Now, this is one we didn't play yet, but I feel like this is a party, so this is a party game, and they're trying to push it, because party games, I, they're still kind of popular. But I kind of feel like this trailer is not good. Or maybe it's just the gameplay that looks really boring to me. It might just be the fact that they got some people who were not very really interesting to like watch and listen to. But I was not impressed by this trailer in the slightest. You get off the bus! Jump, jump! Oh, we made that. Barely, we made that. Okay. okay. Serious biz. Serious biz now. Alright? <laughs> I'm a serious bumblebee here, y'all. I don't know about you. Okay, it's like... There we go. Yeah! They're gonna get it! Uh, the first places are they stand still. They're the game lose. By like a second. By like a second. I don't know. Is it just me? Is, is that not impressive just to me? Or what do you think? No, not super impressed with it. Um, I mean, it looks silly. It kind of just looks like a round version of a Roblox level. Like, something someone made in Roblox. Yeah? I mean, I can see that. And it, I, don't, I don't watch um, gaming YouTubers who just... Or Twitch streamers who just play games and their audience is between like 8 and 12. But it looks like they got like four of those people to play it and be like, This is so fun! Yeah, that's kind of the impression I got. It just didn't look interesting. No. Tyrion, let's watch... Okay. Inkulunati. Inkulunati. I was looking at that, too. This is a terrible name. We were, we were voting on the worst names for games. This one might be up there. But the aesthetics to this look super, super interesting. And it looks like it could be a really funny game. So let's bring up Inkulunati. Because it's just super silly. The emergence of medieval books, a testimony to how we misunderstood the Middle Ages. Why do rabbits have swords and fight against dogs? The thing is, these illuminations are not decorations. They are the vestiges of an ancient ritual. Le rituel que nous ne connaissons pas, mais qui existait à l'époque. So the entire gameplay takes place in that drawing. But I will say that besides the absolutely awful name, it looks very unique in its aesthetics. It looks very silly. It does. Uh, apparently, fecal matter is a attack. Well, of course. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if you can eat puke, you can attack with poop. With, your, with poop, yeah. I, like I guess there's more gas than anything else. I, I would feel attacked if somebody pooped on me. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> I like how in the beginning they made it seem very like Da Vinci Code serious, and then like as it goes on, it's like wait, yeah, this is this. Well, is that's where the I think they're trying to mix ink and Illuminati. I think that and that's what the name is. That's for sure. What the but name I is. I can't say it well. I don't like that name. So then we have Lord of the Rings Gollum. Now this has been in development for I think since I was about three years old at this point. Hmm. This is a really old game. Not really. It's. I think it's a couple years old, but it has not had a good development cycle. There's been well, a lot of issues. Well, we all know how the story ends. Yeah, I mean that too. And so, I, just, I just can't see it being fun playing as him. It doesn't look fun. Tyrion, let's go ahead and watch it. It doesn't look good. The gameplay looks super boring. And I don't know why you'd want to make a game about Gollum. 
but let's check it out. I don't know. It could be uh, mildly entertaining. <laughs> it could, except for the fact that it's been in development for years and years. And I don't see this doing well. The precious is gone. So there's, there's not a lot there, it had some platforming elements, and that's about it. It's just, it's not impressive. But when you take something as fantasy driven as Lord of the Rings, but you center an entire game around the most depressing character ever. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's also like, you know, there are other Lord of the Rings games that are like a lot of fun. Oh, there are. And it just seems like this one doesn't really have a lot of appeal. I, I would play Lord of the Rings online before I play that. Also, is, that's that a, true. <laughs> is that an indictment of Lord of the Rings online, Zach? Yes, because it was basically Lord of the Rings World of Warcraft, and it went... <laughs> Lord of the Rings has the potential for an incredible amount of genres to fit into it. Yes. I could see political intrigue, I could see spy thrillers, action adventures, RPGs, but a game based around Gollum where you have some platforming and sneaking around and you already know exactly how it's going to end. I just don't see it doing well. No. So then we also had Arctic Awakening, which is a narrative adventure game. Uh, think of, I mean, yeah, I guess narrative adventure kind of sums that up. Then we had Returnal, right mm. up there on that list of terrible named games. But this one actually <laughs> looks kind of fun. So let's go ahead and check this out, Tyrion. Returnal is going to be, I think it's exclusive to PS5. It's another time loop game. I actually have really seen good. a lot of um, gameplay stuff from Returnal uh, just scrolling through my Facebook. Hello, my name is Mikhail yeah. Habari, and I, I am the best dev and marketing director at Go ahead and make that full screen. Currently, we're working on Returnal. Uh, Returnal, in a nutshell, is a fast paced uh, sci fi shooter with roguelike elements. And as a new addition to Housemark, we're adding a layer of narrative storytelling. That's... That can't be here. In Returnal, you take on the role of Selene. Selene is a deep space astro scout that crash lands on a planet called Atropos. Uh, on this planet, she quickly realizes that she's stuck in a never ending nightmarish loop that always upon her death she wakes up in the same place but the world has changed and all the challenges that she has to face are different at the focus of the game we have a very tight gameplay loop where you uh, dash jump around shoot at uh, enemies with lots of tentacles coming at you there are also a lot of bullet hell elements so fast-paced maneuvering dodging and running and gunning is the main focus of the game. But there are also lots of the storytelling layers that Celine finds out about um, in a non-linear fashion. So as you make your way through Atropos, you find out who your main character is, what is the sort of deepest uh, secret that she's trying to answer, and also how this planet ties into the whole bigger picture and who are actually the inhabitants of this mysterious planet. Overall, we at Housemark are looking forward to bringing you a very exciting and frenetic uh, shooter experience, and Returnal will be hitting PlayStation 5s on April the 30th this year. So looking forward to having the game out there. Hope you enjoy. Everything has changed. Exactly as I left it. So there's Returnal for you, PS5 yes, exclusive. It looks pretty cool. It does, other than, you know, the title, but... 
<laughs> you know, I'm going to go on record and say I don't hate all of the words smashed together titles. Some of them are just very atrocious. So this is what, Return and Funeral? I think it's Return and Eternal. Eternal. Okay. So you're eternally returning. That makes more sense. Yeah. The uh, the other two, I agree. I think it was what, Instinction and... Uh, Instinction. Oh, uh, Inkluunati. Inkluunati. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Manati. <laughs> So, yeah, that, that game looks pretty fun. I'm a big fan of bullet hell games where you have to dodge, and you, yeah, it's, it's my kind of jam. I enjoy that. Uh, shout out if you actually have a PS5 to the six people out there who do. Uh, <laughs> I don't, so I will not be playing that. Although, when was that release date? It was, what, probably next year? Yeah. Probably, yeah. I didn't actually see that. I didn't notice. So, after Returnal, we had Chris Tales. Now... Tyrion, let's go ahead and bring this one up because this is a. It says it's a love letter to JRPGs, and we both love JRPGs. Now, I will definitely give this a try, but it just doesn't look interesting to me. Maybe it's the art style that I'm not a fan these of. Strange dreams. Maybe it's how they're implementing the turn based combat. Mother. I'm not sure. I'm long ago. But it we need to hurry up. We have to stop her. I do feel a connection. There's something there. I am Wilhelm the Wise. You, it seems, are a time mage. As am I. And while my powers have led to my youthful appearance, yours are the gift to see possibility. Who are you supposed to be? Hello, my name is... Tell me if we survive. You know how to fight? Hold your ground. They won't get past us. Ugh. I don't know about this so one. So many questions. Matthias the Frog, at your service. I have been keeping an eye on you for some time now. I suspected you had been chosen, my dear. It appears I was correct. This will serve as a good opportunity for me to demonstrate my capabilities. I am certain I was created with a purpose. I wish to discover what it was. We'll have time for your banter later. Let's move forward. Hold on. You have a talking frog, and you didn't mention it? A talking frog is like in my top five animals I want to meet! So the consensus is it's more of a love letter, at least in style, to anime. But if the gameplay holds up, then I'll definitely be willing to give it a try. I mean, it definitely looks interesting, even on the story aspect. But I feel like it would probably do a lot better as an actual series, like a TV series. Yeah. I, that's kind of what it looks like to me, too. So... All right, then we've got Axiom Verge 2, and then Naraka Blade Point, which we've already seen yes. those trailers. Then we have Savior, which, again, looks really, really great. Uh, Quantum Error, uh, a sci-fi horror game, which looks okay, I guess. It doesn't hold much appeal to me. Uh, I enjoy an atmospheric thriller, but this is when they throw in the uh, ability to shoot the creatures and then it turns more into an action game and it feels a lot less horror a lot of times horror has the that internal feeling of powerlessness yeah and when you give the protagonist a gun it feels a lot less scary except in resident evil (laughs) yeah if you do it right it can work but this one i don't know it doesn't look that interesting to me so uh, let's bring up Of Bird and Cage, though. This is... So, they describe it as a playable Product metal not yet album. rated. And then in the trailer, they... It, it has a lot of music in it, which I think is great. It's another genre where 
uh, it's not a, what is that? Uh, sort of a rhythm game, but it's one where music plays an integral role in what's happening. So let's go ahead and check this out. So that one looks really interesting. Yeah, the music actually made it way cooler. <laughs> yeah, and that's what it uh, seems like that's what it's all about. I don't know exactly how you play a metal album as a game. It looks like it's uh, very decision-driven, lots mm -hmm. of consequences, branching narrative, which is always fun to see. I really like the trailer where they actually show what happens. Like that last confrontation, it had like four different ones where you won the fight, lost the fight, and then you can decide whether you what you do after that and had all four of those branching and that was really cool yeah. it shows just how branching that narrative can grow and when that's done right it really does actually change the game because then your, your choices actually matter it also opens the door for a lot of that replayability value yeah like playing games over and over to make the different choices yeah sometimes people really want to see how that plays out so after that they came came out game deck which is uh, a game detective, but they forgot a few words there. <laughs> so it's a Sherlock Holmes-esque game, but where you're solving crimes inside of a game. Hmm. I didn't quite understand how that works. Let's go ahead and play this trailer. Game deck looked really interesting, and I love Sherlock Holmes. So this would be a game that I would be interested in. It's a strange in. profession. So this is game deck. game deck. You're neither a player, nor detective. You know the rules and how people break them. How they leave a digital trail. And there is always a trail. A flaw in the source code. Back doors used by cheaters. skins used to cover up unpopular activities all can be found all can be traced with a lot of skill and a little bit of luck sometimes more than a little because there are surprises even for a game deck but in the end you keep your eyes on the prize. The trail never gets cold. And so the game is always on. September 16th. So, really interesting premise of being a sleuth inside of, I think inside of video games, but at the same time not. I mean, that's what it made it sound like, and um, while watching this, I said, I'm like, okay, this can also, this looks like it could also be a really good movie. 
Um, I would totally play this. Yeah. It looks like it's kind of a mini series. They had different locations that you visited and traveled to. Mm -hmm. I think I'd rather just play the games that you're investigating inside of than play this game. <laughs> it's a game about finding hackers is what it looks like. Yeah. Uh, how it works, I'm really curious because I don't think there was any gameplay in there. No, but, but the story has me intrigued. It does. It, the, the concept of it is very unique. Being a detective inside of games, tracing source code, looking for hackers mm -hmm. or something, getting to stab dinosaurs with flags. Like, yeah, I'm all, <laughs> I'm all for it. That sounds great. <laughs> After that came Ember, which we already looked at. Yep. Definitely a game I'll be seeing in my house quite a bit. Then we have Kathy Rain, the director's cut. So Kathy Rain is a game that came out, it sounded like uh, four-ish years ago when they're coming out with a director's cut version of it. So if you enjoy uh, investigating mysteries and a strong narrative, then this is a game that would definitely interest you. Then they had more Back for Blood, which we've already seen and we're going to play. <laughs> We started playing some World War Z last night after talking about Left 4 Dead so much and seeing so much about it. And that's a great game. That genre of co-op survival in a frantic, frantic, like, uh, chaotic world. Yeah. It's a lot of fun. I like that. Then we had Warhammer Age of Sigmar. Uh, no gameplay, very short trailer, and I know nothing about it after watching it. So, yeah, that's cool. Then it looks like we have there, the, so it's called the longest road on earth, and it looks really pretty. But I don't. I think you, this game is more adequately described as an experience instead of a game. Hmm. They even say it. It's a deeply personal narrative title with stripped down mechanics. The trailer itself has no. I think it might have gameplay, but all you're doing is moving back and forth. But it looks like it has some beautiful music. This game, let's let's go ahead and watch it, and then we can give our take on it. So this is called The Longest Road on Earth. While, this this to me left to go. looks really pretty and could be very moving and a really good experience. So go ahead and check this out. On the way, gotta try. Dream my baby feels alright. Feels. I've been walking for a while, there's a hundred miles left to go A hundred miles left to go oh, oh. I've been running out of time, there's a hundred miles left to go A hundred miles left to go oh, oh. So really pretty, but nothing about the game itself. No. This is one where I feel like someone who was a musician wanted to make a game and tell a story. And that's where they came from first. Yeah. Which is absolutely fine. It's just a different approach. And it looks like it's, like I said, it's more of an experience. Which is totally fine. There are games like, um, I haven't played a lot of them, but... Uh, I'm blanking on all the names, but gaming as an experience is a great is a great thing. Being able to create an atmosphere, a world, and one where you just explore. There's no fighting. There's no mystery. There's no threat of death. Where you just get to explore and experience a story. There's not really very many games like that. There are some, but there's not a lot. And so I feel like the more there are, the better. It's not up my alley in the slightest, but I totally encourage it. So, next was Operation Tango. Now, this looked like it could be a lot of fun. Tyrion, let's go ahead and bring this up. It's a really short trailer. 
just a tiny, tiny bit of gameplay, but no real concept. To get it? But it hey, looks like it'll be a, this is a, a lot of fun. Disaster. What did you do? I'm gonna, do, I'm gonna do it. You ready? I'm nervous. I'm in. I'm very stealthy. Thank you very much. So uh, I'm gonna need you to suck it up, Buttercup, and put that passcode in. It's already out, isn't it? Yeah. June 1st. June 1st. So that's just, that's not a reveal. That's like, hey, we're already live. Come buy our game. <laughs> so that's Operation Tango. Uh, it mentioned co op. Yeah, so it's a co op game. It only showed one screen. It didn't look like there was a screen. Not couch co op, no. Those are streamers and one person you know, streaming separately. But yeah, it's, okay. it's online co op. I didn't okay. see any couch co op. But with how, the, how it looked like it was. Design. I mean, again, we didn't really see much gameplay. It just kind of makes me wonder how you would do it for a game like that. A lot of communication. Now, they do have one really cool feature in there. It was it's called uh, Friends Play for Free. Mm -hmm. Now, how they implement that, I'm not entirely sure. But that idea of being able to say, hey, come play this game with me. And your friend's like, oh, I don't own this game. I don't want to spend 50 bucks to play with you. It's like, no, it's totally free for you. Come join. That's awesome. Yeah. It's really awesome. All games should do that. I know they won't. No. <laughs> but that that's so great. So hopefully uh, we see that more and more. I think it was Wolfenstein Youngblood kind of had something similar to that, where they uh, had a version of the game that if someone sent you like a friend code, you could play with them for free. Yeah. I think I, that would actually be a really smart marketing tactic, because... Say the person with the invite code can only play with the person who owns the game when yeah. that code is sent. Mm -hmm. And if they enjoy the game enough, they're probably going to go buy it themselves. Exactly. So, I, I don't see much of a downside to it. Yeah, some people are only going to play with that friend, but you're going to gain more of an audience because they're playing. Because the people that weren't going to play without, without the game copy itself... Some of those are going to then play with it, mm -hmm. and then some of those are going to buy it. Yep. Whereas before, it was the entire audience that didn't have the game, we're not going to buy your game, but now you've shrunk that down to at least some are. So I, in a way, I, do, I don't see a downside to that. It just takes a little more implementation. But it's a really, really cool thing. So I hope we see more of that. After Operation Tango, we saw Oddworld Soulstorm. So Oddworld is a game that goes back quite a ways. There's, uh, there's a, I think it's kind of a long series. It's not one that I was ever into. Uh, I think it's PS PlayStation exclusive, and I didn't own a PlayStation when I was younger. It looks like it's PlayStation and Epic Game Store. Okay. So if you're into Oddworld, they've got more coming out. Wait. On April 6, 2021. So that one's already out. <laughs> Again, that one's already out there, and you can get it for free if you're a PlayStation Plus owner. Then, Serial Cleaners 2. So, it's a sequel, and it's not one I've ever heard of or played, and it looks really interesting. So, you are not the Hitman, but you're the Hitman's cleanup. <laughs> oh, gosh. So why don't we go and check this out? Because this looks really, it looks really different compared to what I'm used to seeing in games. So that looks pretty interesting. Vacuuming the snow. Yeah. I don't see how that works, but it works. 
<laughs> All right, after that, we have Elite Dangerous Odyssey. So Elite Dangerous uh, has been out for quite a while. It's supposed to be one of the greatest space games out there. I have not played it at all. Uh, I haven't either. The only space game I was really able to get into was Freelancer back back in the day. And that was a pretty fun game. I, I feel like I could get into them, but so many of them, like EVE Online we talked about, just have a learning curve that takes a full-time job mm -hmm. for a month or two. <laughs> And I don't have that kind of time to invest in one game. But let's go and check out this. I believe it's a, uh, an add-on to Elite Dangerous. It's if Elite Dangerous is up your alley. Then it's really good. It's not for us. Hello, I'm Gareth Hughes from Frontier Developments, and I'm the lead designer on Elite Dangerous. Right now, we're working on Elite Dangerous Odyssey, the most ambitious expansion for Elite Dangerous to date. For the first time in Elite's history, the Odyssey expansion will allow players to set foot on light atmospheric worlds powered by amazing new planetary technology. Players will be able to disembark from their ships and explore these planets, discovering new settlements and organic life forms while taking on missions and engaging in intense first-person combat. Today, we're really excited to share this exclusive footage of Apex Interstellar. Welcome to Apex Interstellar, your gateway to the stars. A shuttle service that will be available to all Odyssey players, allowing them to explore the galaxy in a totally new way. For a small fee, Apex Interstellar will let players book their own personal shuttle, complete with AI pilot, to take them between the ports and settlements in inhabited space. Your shuttle is ready to depart. Thank you for choosing Apex Interstellar. Players can even call a shuttle to pick them up directly from a planet's surface, just like you'd hail a cab. Additionally, we'd like to talk about how the release of Odyssey will give players the opportunity to experience the excitement, scale and beauty of Elite Dangerous from a brand new perspective. Odyssey's boots on the ground gameplay will add on-foot exploration, salvaging, bounty hunting, heists, and much more, all seamlessly integrated into the existing game. Elite Dangerous Odyssey is coming to PC in late spring 2021, with an alpha scheduled to begin a little earlier on the 29th of March. PlayStation and Xbox releases are planned for autumn 2021. Thank you for watching. Please enjoy the rest of the show, and we look forward to seeing you in the game. So they're adding the ability to get on the ground, FPS. Mm -hmm. It's almost an entire another game they're putting inside of their game. It really does seem that way. It was reminding me of Destiny, but I feel like less limited. Like I, I only played Destiny once and I felt like it was fun. It was an interesting new concept, but it wasn't quite as exploratory as this seems to be. Yeah. Yeah, there's... There's a lot of things you can do in Elite Dangerous, a lot of worlds to explore, a lot of different ways to play, and this is just adding a whole new section to that. Definitely something I'd be willing to try out with some good friends. Next up was Don't Forget Me. Now, this game, I feel like the developer was a programmer first and had a very interesting idea and then wanted to create that game. Because this game looks like it tackles a lot more of the tech side of gameplay than the artistic side. So let's go and check this one out. It's called Don't Forget Me. And it has a tagline of, what, imagine what you could do with a machine that could read memories.
So, I'm not. There's there's still a lot about it that we don't know, but it looks really really interesting. So, that's something that I feel like there's there's a lot going behind the scenes where the gameplay comes from your choices, and there's going to be a lot of very interesting choices that you interact with the AI and how you play really determines what you see and what you can actually play. Yeah. It looks like a really interesting concept that I would love to play. Yeah. It's it it does. So, after that, we've got uh Fire Commander, then War Hospital, which we already saw the trailer for. Yep. Uh Lost Words Beyond the Page, Haunted Space, Sub Rosa, uh, then Life is Strange, True Colors, which we've already seen a little bit of that, Humankind, Saw and then some of that. Kina. So there's a lot going on there. There's a lot of reveals. Uh, I think we have time for one more before the next thing hits, which is actually uh, next thing is Mythic Games. Mythic games, games, which actually might be happening right now. So let's go and tune back into E3 and check this out. See what they're talking about. There's over 70,000 NFTs that have already been purchased in our open beta, and uh, where we've been seeing just tons and tons of people jump in. Oh, jeez. Now that NFTs are moving into the mainstream, the most important thing for games, for gaming studios that want to focus on NFTs is to really ensure that their gameplay, their player experience is on par or exceeds anything else in the mainstream market today. We're putting the fun in non-fungible tokens. That's what we're doing. It's gonna be really exciting to see the game, the community grow over the next few months. What we're building here with NFTs and blockchain really changes that script because then it's players that can actually benefit and profit off of all the money they spend. Part of my art is, is exists in the fine art world. And in that world, I could create a painting and sell a painting, and then that painting goes off to a collector, and then I get paid once, right? And then I have no idea, no control over who gets the other the painting, no idea if 20 people sell it down the road for exponential amount of money. I never see a dime of that. I have no idea what to think. So one of the cool things about NFTs is that smart contract that's locked in and, and you're able to just not only track who gets it, but share that profit forever. While one will collect for love, the other side that you want to collect from is also from a perspective of capital appreciation. You know, when we look at the collector world today, vinyl toys are on a, on a tear, right? Just the very fact that Blanco's Block Party created a platform where you could not only collect digital vinyl toys created by epic vinyl toy artists, but at the same time, use those vinyl toys to battle other people in games. I truly believe that the magic formula for, you know, not only epic capital appreciation on the assets themselves, but also, you know, immense amount of enjoyment in playing the game. Today's gamers are used to having a lot of control over customizing the experience that they have. We've seen that in the trend of games coming out over the last 10 years. Players spend a lot of time online. They spend a lot of time in digital space. That's where they want to express themselves, through skins, through cosmetics, through the things that they buy through games. I think that's where you know, Blanco's really shines and what we, what we can bring to the table, but also where I think NFTs play a huge role, right? Like because it gives you a chance to really own the, 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 the world around you, the universe that you're customizing, you're creating. You've got a greater stake in this thing now. Rudy Koch, SVP Business Development. Am I just supposed to say that? Just my name, title? All right. I'm a big time collector. I collect vinyl toys. I have a whole wall of them at home. Uh, I'm a nerd. We were all, we're all nerds. We all collect. I love collecting. Um, I actually started my career in comic books. I collect sneakers. I loved Magic the Gathering. I had hundreds. These concepts as collectors ourselves, uh, like the box opening, you know, opening a box for your Blanco or the serial numbers on each of the NFTs that you buy. These are concepts that live in the physical collector's world that we love so much. And we wanted to bring that and translate that into the digital world. And what's amazing is that with the players that we've seen so far and the people engaging with the economy, they are getting these concepts. And it's been a lot of fun to see that all unfold. With real toys in real life, right? Uh, when the way to keep their value is you put them in the box, you 
put them on the shelf, you leave them there. But with Blinkos, as you play with them, uh, they get better. Uh, you can you can customize them. You, you can make them uh, the way that you want them to, to be, but also increase their rarity um, and increase their scarcity by playing with them. Our leveling up process, uh, it's called Grade Up. It draws from uh, from real toy and collectible culture. Uh, it's it's kind of a, a neat turn on on everything that you would think about collectibles. I'm looking to invest in and acquire assets from games that have the ability to move into the mainstream, games that have the ability to become AAA titles. There, there are mainly three that top my list. Again, Blanco's Block Party, Gods Unchained, as well as Axie's Infinity. They've been able to integrate blockchain within their gaming mechanisms, uh, really in the background, while rather than having it to be a requirement to be able to participate in the game and participate in the community. Get yours, yeah, yeah, yeah. Get the money. A really key focus for um, for my team has been making sure that our, our marketplace is very accessible for really all players in the game. Uh, this is going to continue to develop as we add more functionality around uh, cryptocurrencies, being able to use your crypto wallet. But the core focus of our product is making sure that the mainstream audience is able to, to enjoy the game and have, have a super simple experience. Historically, like if you're playing a game and you're, you know, you're trying to s sell your items, the game developer doesn't support that, right? And Mythical Games takes the stance of we we'll, we enable it and we facilitate it. Mythical's uh, blockchain is uh, uses proof of authority for consensus, which basically is a much lower carbon footprint than proof of work. Um, and we're planning to bridge the multiple chains. Um, we're bridging to Ethereum, which is. I'm about to go to proof of stake, which is about 99.5% less energy. By using blockchain technology, you own your game assets, and then you can, you know, you can build another marketplace. You can build another interface. You can bring them into another game, different metaverses, and that's a new paradigm. And it's inevitable. And I think gamers are going to demand it. Traditionally, like when you're participating in a marketplace, you're relying on trust and the company to keep the database accurate where Mythical Games is using a blockchain where our smart contracts are publicly accessible. So you have confidence and trust that you're getting what you're buying and your true ownership and you have it forever. Because traditionally game companies can just say there are a thousand of them, but who knows if there are a thousand, right? With Mythical Games, we have provable scarcity. And with provable scarcity, as an investor, a collector, or a gamer, that's really what you, you want. I've been drawing since I could hold a pen or a pencil. My granddad taught me how to do an engineer drawing when I was four. You know, I've just fell in love okay. with the idea Okay, I definitely thought we were live before. Uh, so, as I started to look around at art, this is it a game really appealed to me, but based I was always really on the premise of art and, and buying music that Funko I Pops to. digitally you know, Funko Pops like for an insane amount of money, yep. uh, and then reselling them to other people who buy them for an insane amount so of money. It, for me, it just evolved over time as I started to your Funko Pop learn a bit more about on street art. And then it's worth more. On this private market and sell it. Painting an illegal wall to bring up the page. So go to blancos.com. Let's take a look at this. Even their game site, ninety percent of this is simply buying and selling. Like, there's almost... there's I, Okay, there's two sections about the game itself. It says you can party up, and then you can make your own games, and that's it. Everything else is about the design, about selling and buying, and about how you're actually going to be able to own these things. Oh. But you can't. The... Well, and it's NFT-driven... It's NFT driven, which is, I believe, a huge fad that is already beginning in the decline. Yep. And the the biggest issue with something like this is if I spent ten thousand dollars on Blancos and then next month they decide that they're done and shut down their servers, every single NFT, every single purchase that was made well, is really now invalidated because their servers had it all. Yeah. yeah, sure. It's powered by blockchain. It has proof of concept. You're owning it with an NFT. But all of that data lives on their server. So if they shut it down, it's worthless. Mm -hmm. Cryptocurrency survives because the blockchain 
is accessible by by everyone in the world and unless the internet itself dies then crypto is fine right. this is i don't see anything about this here there was like a section where it was just like people sitting around a table talking about how much they love microtransactions which i feel like is just like an atrocity this like <laughs> Grew up in the, 80s. This the, is bad. the idea that this is something that people would want, that like people in the gaming community would want, is just offensive. The, the idea behind being able to own something digitally is great. The idea of having a game where you have something unique to yourself is cool. I will let my friend but an entire game built around the idea of buying and selling the American things company, inside of that game, it's not a game, it's a marketplace. Some incredible yeah, and folks, you don't actually own muscle, the asset so long as it you know, lives in that marketplace. Want to honor his memory. Unless there's a way for you to take it out and put it into some sort of digital wallet. But well, they have a lot of like physical representations here, and they're, they're showing off a product line right here. Like... I don't know what is going on with this presentation. We came in just a few minutes late, and I feel like maybe we've missed something. Yeah, I don't know. I don't think this is going to do well. Uh, in the in the chats, in um, on the actual EP live stream itself, nobody is for this. It is lots of thumbs down, lots of just no, and this is a scam. It's Oh boy. I mean, it probably would be a pretty cute game if they took out all the NFTs and transactions and everything else out of it. Except, what's the game? Yeah, it's you, you have your what are they called Funko Pops? But what's what, what is the game? Yeah, like what's the game I haven't play seen aspect? They haven't talked about it at all. A game yet. I mean, I'm not someone who's going to buy uh, NFT, so this already is not for me. I wonder, I think, so here, here's, some, here's something that, that it could be, though. Like, what if it's like the Funko Pop version of Roblox? Free to play, but with microtransactions. I mean, that's kind of what it looks like in some of the... Yeah, it, it looks like you make your own game, but... Where it keeps its integrity, and it is in bastardized whether it's on geometry or it's sculpted I or don't just, understand you know, home walls and stuff like that I like that I just like exploring the space I really I mean, don't understand what's happening essence of cohesion as opposed to a random vomit but exhibit games like you know we can really uh, great, like, bridge okay between you know the traditional mediums of creating art digital art or you know street art or stuff like that and then into oh, the game man. and that's cool because i mean all the elements that are i hope e3 uh moves this really along well executed in these skins it's already been on it too long yeah this this isn't as okay cool. so after mythical games is the indie game showcase which should be a lot better yes i agree because so far, I have not seen anything mythical or games about this. So now that the video is coming to a close, download Blankos, Blankos.com. Oh, bring oh thank good, you. it's coming to a close. Build your own levels, buy all the designs from your favorite brands, artists, and designers. Share it with all your friends so they Ugh, download and play it together. That's a big yikes. And we look forward to seeing you within the world of Blankos. But wait. We're partnering with the fashion industry's most coveted brands to bring you their style, Blanco style. And our first collab is a name you'll recognize. They're known worldwide for their signature plaids and heritage products. So again, I'm incredibly excited the idea of a game where you really own something like unique to it is, is awesome. Like, even if you just implemented that and in any game that you had now T so take call of duty mm -hmm. take fortnite take any game and if you actually had a skin for a gun for an outfit that was legitimately yours that only one player in the entire community could own this that would be amazing right then that would be worth something because if you wanted that one you could sell it you could customize it maybe i don't know but i mean it might be worth something but is it worth like 835 dollars no i mean depending on the skin absolutely no and and before um before we were back they were 
what, what right. they were talking about how you can level your uh, Funko Pop character and once it reaches a certain level it's worth like this monetary value or something so what I was talking to, uh, to Aaron about is that it reminds me of like in World of Warcraft you have the gold sellers where they just create a character to do nothing but farm crap get a bunch of gold and they go sell it online like on eBay or something yeah you got power levelers who just make characters and sell them yeah and that too thank you appreciate it on behalf of all of us at Mythical Thanks but for that was like a backdoor thing, whereas like this it. game is all that, and it's and it's not even doing it well because the thing is like they're not unique. A thousand, two thousand other people can own your design because they're they're done through serial numbers, mm -hmm. which means that that design can be out there ten thousand times. You own four thousand eight hundred twenty-two, and it's level four. But what is that? <laughs> It, this is clearly not for us. No. It doesn't seem to be for gamers. So I don't know who it's for. This uh, is for the people who spent $70 million on NFTs last year. Yeah. <laughs> These are the people who are funding this, who want to see it made, and are... And are wanting to make money from the artwork that they put into it. Yeah. And artists getting paid. Yeah, sure. That's great. This is not how you do it. This is super dumb. It also seems like it kind of came too late in the game for this to even work. Yeah, if this had came out last year, but they probably came up with the idea for it last year. Yeah, that's the yeah. thing is... It, it didn't have a fast enough turnaround for them to actually, you know, take advantage of people being interested in the marketplace. No, because you can't. Hopefully that doesn't happen to Avatar. <laughs> We have well, a. Uh... If they actually release another Avatar movie with the game, that might actually be fine. Right. Uh... So they had a 20 minute presentation from Mythical Games where there was about 90 seconds of gameplay and 28 and a half minutes of talking about how you can buy stuff in the game. Literally. That's what it was. There was nothing about the game. Nothing about the mechanics. It was just, come buy our crap. And then you can sell it, because it's unique, except it isn't. But it is. It looks like the announcers on E3 right now are just trying to justify what the gameplay might be and piece it together. But, like, it just looks it's like... so clear that that was not the focus of this. Yeah, they're completely lost, too. Yeah. yeah someone here in the comments said what I was about to say, too, just, like, it looks just like a like a robot Roblox scam. Yeah. Oh, and now they're they're mentioning Roblox too. Roblox, you know, just went public on the stock market. Uh, they went public a few months ago. Yeah. Yeah, and I think they did pretty well. They're. Yeah. It's a huge company. They're a huge company. It's a huge game. But. Yeah. Okay, so it sounds like it is free to play. But, yeah, I, this is not, uh, I predict this will be dead in three months, but this is, this is bad. Can you guys imagine how your wives would react if you spent $835 on a Blanco? I wouldn't, I wouldn't have a wife anymore, let's just put it that way. Yeah, same. Jeez. <laughs> Wow. Okay, well, <laughs> that was fun. I need a drink. Uh, okay, now E3. Looks like they're moving on. Oh, no. No, it's back to Mythical Games. Yeah, it's still Mythical Games interviewing oh, people. Okay. Now, some people in the comments are talking about how NFTs destroy the environment. I, I, I'm not I have, as in tune on as to what that is. I have no idea. I Like I said, I know very little about them besides the fact that... It's another way for artists to make money on a private exchange. It is, and it kind of works, but at the same time, NFTs can literally be made by anyone at any time for free and then sold. And those NFTs will only last as long as the company you made them with is still around. Yeah. And the companies right now are starting up 200 a day. And... 199 of them are dying a day. 
And so your NFTs are worthless within a week if, if you bought them from a wrong company. Or from a company that went bankrupt, you know, or is no longer there. It's so the bubble that's popping rapidly. Whereas, yes. whereas the companies that are doing good hosting these NFTs probably charge a really high premium now. Yeah, they do. Um, man, I, okay. I, I want to get out. Oh. <laughs> Let's just uh, let's let's move away from this. Let's see if we can find something a little more interesting. Uh, I think we're gonna take just a small break. The indie showcase is in about twenty five minutes, which I'm really excited about. But let's find something not one hundred percent microtransaction focused to put on our stream for a little while. Tyrion, you got any ideas? Let's actually check something out. I think what we might be able to do is make. Um, I'm gonna take a look at something. Future games. Well, I have a great idea for the next few seconds, which is to run our ad for your course. So here's that. To do what? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> JPEG, you know, is kind of the, the answer you're going to get, but it's it's really a lot more than that. It's the underlying framework and technology that allows for, uh, you know, the the blockchain provenance, you know, that, that unique identifier that can be used from platform to platform to platform. So think of it as like what Steam is to video games is, uh, you know, is like the world Steam, you know, like, so it's every... Every time you log into Steam or something like that, it's gonna they're gonna use Steamworks to like you know grab achievements and stuff like that. It's all stored on the on that centralized system. The blockchain being the, the similar concept, but decentralized across all computers and stuff like that. And because um, the way that the the infrastructure works with blockchain is that that's all very easily swappable. The metadata, not the actual assets, but that metadata that ties to the assets can be interchangeable between. A multitude of systems so now i think that i people are just now starting to kind of take
once upon a time. Our lands teemed with creatures great and small. The beauty of the worlds was unrivaled. The people thrived and lived in harmony with the land around them. But this harmony was not to last. Slowly, without much notice, the withering was creeping out from the darkness. Once it took hold, there was little that could be done. Our lands were overrun, and all that was cherished disappeared before us. But all was not lost. One young, brave soul stayed behind. With support from their friends and with boundless determination. This young soul seeks out a way to push back the withering and bring life back to our world. Grow, Song of the Ever Tree. This is a very different world. Hi, I'm Rich Newbold, Game Director at Frontier Developments. So as you may have seen earlier at the PC Game Show, we're working on Jurassic World Evolution 2. We're really excited about it and we're looking forward to creating the most authentic Jurassic experience yet. We've got tons of new features across four different game modes, including our original Jurassic campaign, which is a story set after the events of Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom. We're going to be leading efforts to contain, control and conserve all those dinosaurs now running out in the wild. You'll be working alongside characters from the films, voiced by original talent, such as Jeff Goldblum. And in the game, we have over 75 prehistoric species. We've got new dinosaurs, we have returning community favorites, and we've added flying and marine reptiles to the game. I'm really thrilled to be showing you a first look at footage from the game itself. This is a from our species field guide series of videos focusing on one of the many prehistoric species we have in the game. This is an iconic, popular dinosaur, it's the Triceratops, but we're showing you it in a new environment never seen before in Jurassic World Evolution. I hope you enjoy it and are looking forward to the game releasing later this year. The Triceratops is one of the most recognizable herbivores to ever have existed. It is best known for its trio of facial horns. These adornments are not just for display purposes. The brow horns in particular can inflict considerable damage to any dinosaur that dares to provoke it. Coming later in 2021, Esports Boxing Club brings you the greatest fight roster in video game history. With over 200 fighters already signed, we've got some of the biggest and most anticipated the names. Of all time. From the absolute legends of the sport to the most exciting names in boxing today. The first women's division ever represented in a video game and the hottest new talent. But what about the game? Let's take a closer look at the next-gen visuals and gameplay that are set to make ESBC the greatest of all time. It's good. It's definitely one for the grandkids and stuff to say. Like your old granddad was in a game and busting people up, so aye, it's, uh, it's going to be quite cool. So the movement system in ESBC is all about fluidity, being able to create angles, recreating mannerisms from boxes. The physics system doesn't just rely on animation. This allows us to recreate realistic knockdowns. Even when a fighter is unsteady on their feet, it's not purely animation based. Now we've had professional boxers, professional coaches come into the studio and provide input through motion capture, and actually reviewing the game during its development 
and now we really feel like we've created a true representation of the sport. Presentation is important to us, just because we are in the studio, we're still going to aim high when it comes to production values. Esports Boxing Club, coming to PC and all major consoles with early access in 2021. Product not yet rated. My name's Max Rea. I'm the founder of Black Matter and the lead developer of Hell Let Loose. Hell Let Loose began as the idea of a couple of hobbyist game developers all the way back in 2015. Following a successful Kickstarter, we launched into early access in the middle of 2019. And since then, we've delivered nine enormous updates, including entire systems overhauls, six new maps, tons of new weapons, gadgets, and vehicles, as well as expanding our unique real-time strategy-inspired metagame. As a result, we've been fortunate to sell more than a million copies during our first year of early access. 2021 is only going to be bigger. I'm excited to announce that we're launching out of early access on July the 27th, with the introduction of the Soviet forces on the Eastern Front, including famous battles like Kursk and Stalingrad, before we close out the year by bringing Hell Let Loose to next generation consoles. Hell Let Loose has only grown due to the vibrant community that surrounds it, from our earliest Kickstarter backers to our newest recruits. We're excited to introduce you to this ever evolving and expanding World War II experience. We hope you enjoy this first look at what's to come. Hello, my name is Karolis Horvath, CEO of Ironwood, a game dev studio based in Croatia. And for the past few years, we have been working on the Red Saucer 2 game. It is a real-time tactical battlefield game. It supports up to 8 players and has a fully playable co-op campaign. We are ready to show you the launch trailer now. So get ready for June 17, when the game launches on Steam, and uh, have fun blasting some missions. You are the executor. A high-class commanding officer with advanced cybernetic capabilities. You were awakened to lead a secret task force that will counter the threat of Stroll mutants and liberate Mars. Welcome back, Executor. The Stroll infestation has now infected all colonies on Mars. Build your squad from six unique classes of elite soldier, utilizing their skills to best suit each mission type. Customize their weapons and tech, as well as their upgrades and abilities. Take command on the battlefield using the command radio to give orders to the whole squad or individual soldiers. Concentrate fire on targeted locations and carry out supply runs even during the heat of battle. Recruit your friends to the fight and join in up to eight player co-op missions to save Mars in our name. Hi, I'm Dylan from Gamius, and it's great to be here at the Future Game Show. We're currently getting very close to finishing Lake, a game that's set in the 80s. You play as Meredith Weiss, who takes a break from her life in the big city to deliver mail in her hometown. 
It's a job you can do at your own leisure, and you will get to know the people in Providence Oaks along the way. Today, we're excited to share an example of an activity after your workday is done. Movie night with Angie from the video store. This is fun. It's been ages since I've been to the movies. Well, they call it the movies, plural. But of course, we can only see one movie at a time. So, which one will it be? My pick? All right, let's see. Big Trouble in Little China, Blue Velvet, or The Great Mouse Detective. All right, I'm ready to pick. The Great Mouse Detective. <laughs> Wouldn't have picked you for a Disney fan. Oh well, let's get in touch with our inner child. <laughs> we won't spoil more, and we also can't say what Meredith will do after spending two weeks in Providence Oaks, because it's all up to you. Lake is coming first to Xbox and PC this September 1st. Thanks for watching, and enjoy the rest of the show. In the beginning, there was dust, and from that dust, the moon was born. Eons of idleness passed, before suddenly, it shattered. Great celestial chunks cascaded from the heavens unto Earth. From one prodigious shard spawned humanity, and from another, the gods. For a great many years, balance endured, until a foul and malevolent deity intervened. Exil spread greed and distrust among his kin, compelling these calamitous beings to conquer man. Centuries of servitude passed, until finally, aided by a veiled ally, humanity revolted. The Great Crusade overthrew the old gods, imprisoning them within the sacred walls of the citadel. At the expense of untold lives, a peace was wrought, but it was not meant to last, for the miscreant Exil returned from his concealment, conducting atrocious experiments upon his caged kindred. A darkness permeated the lands. Rivers stagnated, crops failed, and the world of man began to fade. The great moon, witnessing all, wept a final shard. A shard of the purest obsidian. And thus, a glimmer of hope remains. Hi there, thanks for tuning in. Hopefully our little trailer has got you interested. My name's Tom, and I'm part of the team at Darkflow Software behind our new game, Enlisted, a historical World War II shooter with some unique gameplay quirks. One of Enlisted's most unique features is the Squads Mode, where you head into battle with a squad of AI soldiers under your control. You can instruct them on how to react to enemies, and most importantly, you can switch between any of them seamlessly with the press of a button. You'll only need to respawn when your entire squad is wiped out. This way, you're always kept right in the middle of the action. Although, if you prefer a more traditional shooter experience, we have a fleshed out solo mode too, where you will only fight against other players. At its core, Enlisted aims to form a golden middle ground between the more hardcore and arcade style shooters currently available. Time to kill is kept short. A bolt action rifle to the chest will down a soldier in a single shot, with submachine guns and pistols taking only a few hits. Vehicles as well can of course be devastating, but have their limitations. Aircraft are restricted to the cockpit view, and crew inside tanks can only use viewports to spot targets, so you'll need to keep your wits about you to really get the most out of these machines. Progression in Enlisted is spread over various campaigns. Currently, you can fight in Moscow, Normandy and Berlin, with Tunisia and many more coming soon. Each campaign features new weapons and equipment. 
Firearms can be improved to increase their raw performance, and soldiers can be leveled up to grant them specialized perks. Different classes of soldiers are able to equip different gear, with specialist classes such as engineers able to build structures anywhere on the map, including fobs, sandbags and barbed wire defenses, and even anti-tank cannons and AA guns. Enlisted aims to keep historical accuracy in the forefront of development. Firearms, locations and uniforms are all true to history. No neon pink Sten guns and mohawks here. Each army will be decked out with the equipment they actually used during their respective conflicts. Because of the squads feature, you'll never be short on targets. Twitch reflexes and fast reactions will of course have their place in Enlisted, but even if you haven't had the time to fine tune your skills, you'll easily be able to come away with a kill count in the double digits. The AI, however, are very attentive and react to sound, and not to be underestimated. But that's all we've got time for. Make sure to give it a try yourself by heading over to enlisted.net slash join. Enlisted is cross-platform and available now on PC, PS5, and Xbox Series X and S, and currently in open beta. New content is added regularly, and no progress will be wiped upon the full release. Once you've signed up, use the code ENLISTNOW for a free bonus on us. I've been Tom, and I hope to see you all on the battlefield. Cheers.
So what we're seeing right now is the Indie Game Showcase at E3. We're just going to leave the trailers up for you to enjoy. We can just watch them right along with you. And if anything super exciting stands out, we'll jump in for a minute, give you our reactions. But for the most part, let's just enjoy the trailers because it looks like that's what they're going to give us. Been a long time, Michael. I heard you were back in town. But I don't remember sending you an invitation. I'd kill you myself. But where's the fun in that? No, Michael. I'm gonna roll out the red carpet for you. <laughs> the intel. Good. Now take it to the uplink. The base will blind. Target is marked. Oh, thanks. Ciao. So, come on. What's the deal with this intel? I guess I'll kill you now. The drone is down. The drone is mine. job, you know, the heist, larceny. Larceny? More like... Oh, I have a plan. 
a most ingenious plan to end this war to sweet and straight away. So I asked to see the general, but the sergeant told me no. He said, in a trench is where you meant to stay. I said, dear sergeant, pardon me. I see that I've made you upset. But let me tell you my plan to save the day. Oh, let's try being a little nicer. Let us all agree to disagree. Send some flowers to the Kaiser, and then we'll all be home in time for tea. Oh, let's try being a little sweeter. You catch more flies with honey, don't you see? If the brass would change their tone, then we could all go home. But the generals never listen. The generals never listen. The generals never listen to me. Ah, uh, that was tough. Hamilton, some beast is looking at us. You look at that. Mars is one heck of a planet. So green and beautiful. Let's just be careful, sir. Game developers are creative, passionate, and driven. We tackle new technologies and overcome many challenges in the pursuit of our creative vision. At the IGDA, it is our mission to support and empower all game developers around the world. We provide community, mentorship, research, knowledge, and best practices. We're here for you when you need it, so you can advance your career while keeping your health. Join us and help make our industry a better place for all of us, now and in the future. Help make a difference and join the IGDA.
what are you really made of? That music got me hyped, huh? I was yeah. like, okay, I'm here for it. Um, All right, so that was the indie games, and that looked pretty good. Yeah. That was pretty fun. I feel like there was a lot there. They showed a bunch of games. Uh, let's go back and take a look at some of them more in depth, though. So, Tyrion, first, let's do Bark. I think it's actually B Ark. That's what I found. You can search it at barkthegame.com. This is a four-player co-op bullet hell game, which looks like a lot of fun. Definitely something that I'm going to be playing probably pretty soon. It looks like you can find a free soundtrack on their website. You can wishlist it for the Nintendo Switch and on Steam. So, it says it's coming soon, and I don't see a specific date. On their website, they said something about May, but it's not out yet, so it's not in May. Mm -hmm. Not May 2021. That's what the original date was that I saw there. So, must be wrong. So, I think it's coming out soon, and that looks pretty fun. It does. The Steam store just says coming 2021. Yeah, so. so it doesn't have a release date specifically yet, which is unfortunate. So, But this is one that looks like I, I'm going to be seeing it in my house and probably playing it quite a bit. Uh, these kind of co-op, frantic shooters, shooter games are just a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. uh, they're easy to get into. This one looks like it's got a lot of personality. Super silly with playing as a bear. Uh, what is that? Let's see. A bear, a dog... A rabbit and what is that is that a wolf i don't know what that is so not a uh not a shooter uh, or a frantic shooter but what it was kind of reminding me of a little bit was um lovers in a dangerous space time oh yeah yeah that's what i was thinking too is the art style is similar yeah lovers is again a hugely popular game in my house really fun mm -hmm. my son plays Pretty it all frantic. the time not a, not like i said not like a frantic uh what were you calling it bullet hell yeah not not a frantic like bullet hell type of thing but you definitely do feel frantic a lot of the time in that game <laughs> there's a lot of yelling going on trying to communicate what you should be doing uh my four-year-old oh no my five-year-old loves to control the engines but he does not know how to drive well so that's a pain. You're when telling me your five-year-old can't drive yet? I know. I don't know what's wrong with him. I have Ugh. been failing him as a parent. <laughs> uh, as a, But he's great on the shields. So when he gets on the shields, he is perfect. We, we were playing it a couple weeks ago, and we had a really close encounter where he was on the shields, I was on the engines, and we had about two health left and 20 ships coming at us. We found this little crevice where we could just hide right there. Mm -hmm. He guarded us with the shields, I jumped on the guns, and we survived. It was incredible. Wow. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> so that's a great game. I'm expecting this one to be really good, too. So B Arc looks like a lot of fun. Let's see. what I'm going to see if we can find a list of what all they showed here. So I will say that they did a great job on that. It they was did. just E3 games. It was just, it was just games, trailers, back-to-back-to-back. And that's exactly what it should be. <laughs> Good job, E3. You did it right. All right. Let's see. Let me make sure I find the right ones. This doesn't look like it's... This is it. So, Zach, what kind of indie games do you like to play? Hmm. So, indie games can be anything from solo dev, Axiom Verge, Stardew Valley, up to yeah. like a small team. I, I would consider probably even Team 17 games like Moving Out, Overcooked. Those are pretty small indie games. Yeah, what I kind did, of games do you like to play? I did really enjoy Overcooked. Um, and you can correct me if I'm totally wrong on this, because I don't remember if it was an indie game or not. But I did enjoy playing uh, Terraria years ago when it came out. I'm not sure on that. It, it has a good feel of an indie game. So, I'm not sure their size, though. I think for me, um, it's probably just going to have to be something that has a good story and seems pretty open world, even on like a 2D side scroller type of thing, kind of like Terraria was, where you, you can just go on this endless map. Hmm. 
But those are the ones I like. Anything multiplayer, um, you, especially if it's like couch co-op, like what we were talking about with Lovers in a Dangerous Space Time, yeah. um, is also a lot of fun to do. Yeah, we've also been playing a lot of Stardew Valley. Uh, it's a lot of fun. Really easy to get into. And it's great for a huge variety of people. And that game was made by one person, which is incredible. I've done a little bit of looking to his sales figures. That guy is a multimillionaire. I don't doubt it. I know that's a huge game. Uh, it is a I, know, huge I haven't played game. it yet. My wife has played it several times, so she loves it. Yeah, Stardew Valley is a great game. So I'm not able to find uh, an easily accessible list here and see what you can come up with. You might have to scrub back through and see if you can actually locate the names of each game that they put on there. I'm not seeing it yet. I'm sure someone's going to compile it soon. Maybe we'll be the first ones to do that and just take a look at all of those indie games. I think there was probably about 10 trailers that shown off. Some of them looked really interesting. Uh, I'm kind of excited to get my hands on those. And some of those, a lot of those games, because they're indie, a lot of those games were 2D. Uh, and if you want to learn how to make 2D games, check out my book, letslearnthistogether.com. Best place to get started. Uh, there was one there that, what was that? Uh, it was like that. It's like, it's an 8v8 PvP. We were talking about it. The trailer was really, really good. Uh, reminded you of like... Larsenauts. Was the name Larsenauts. Of the yeah. Yep. Let's take a look at that Larsenauts trailer again, Tyrion. As we bring up the rest of them. Because that was a really great trailer. So this is an example of how you do a trailer. So for one, it introduces the art style. Mm -hmm. It's a cinematic, but it also shows gameplay. It's got character. And it introduces you to everything that makes the game unique. So it's a hero-based, team co-op, PvP, with objective game modes. Which looked really good for it being in the indie game category. It did. It looked really great. Jiren, you got that? Okay, go and put that up. Got the intel. Good. Now take it to the uplink. The base will blind. Target is marked. Oh, thanks. So, so remind me, what's the deal with this intel? I guess I'll kill you now. The drone is down. The drone is mine. Job, you know, the heist, larceny. Larceny? More like. So there's Larcenots by Impulse Gear. Mm -hmm. Now, what's interesting is this is actually going to be a VR game. So on Oculus and on Steam VR. Which, exp which is pretty impressive in general. Yeah. Like, VR games require a lot more. Uh, a lot more work, I think, because you're creating an entire environment, and then you have to create it so that you can look around, and those controls are a little bit different. Yeah. Now, making VR games is a lot of fun. Playing VR games is great. I picked up an Oculus recently. I've been playing a lot of Beat Saber. Mm -hmm. It's awesome. But it's not for everyone, which then also makes it kind of difficult. So you've got, I think, and the teams I'm seeing are like 8v8 on this, yep. which means you've got to have a player base that's fairly large to create a team of 16 
And VR is not that large of a community. It's not. It, so it's possible. There are a lot of big games out there. Population One is a huge battle royale game, and it's a lot of fun. Uh, there's a lot of players out there. So I think a game like this can definitely thrive. It's not that it's not going to work, but it does face challenges that it's not uh, that aren't uh, you, that you don't really see in traditional games as much. Like the barrier to entry is a lot more expensive to get into VR for now. I, I mean, I think as the VR industry grows, the the cost is gonna is gonna I guess equal out. It will. It'll get easier. Right now, uh, you can get an Oculus for about three hundred dollars, mm-hmm. which is the price of an Xbox Series S. Uh, I think the PlayStation Five is five hundred or four hundred for the cheapest. Probably. Is that right? PlayStation Five. I'm trying to remember how much it is, but yeah, so the barrier to entry is going to be at least 300 to get into this game, and even though it looks really good, I can't see anyone buying it, buying a VR headset to play this game. No. But for the audience that's already on there, I think it's a big win for them. It's kind of like a couple years ago, mulling over the decision, do I get the new PlayStation to play the new Spider-Man? Yeah. Or do I pick up the Switch to play Zelda? Mm -hmm. There are some launch titles that you buy the console to play the game. Yeah. And then some people sell the console right after they beat that game. (laughs) But, yeah. This is an indie game. I think it looks great Mm -hmm. for what it is, though. So, Another uh, indie game that was in in all the trailers they showed that I thought was really nice was actually the first one with the paper airplane. Yeah, let's bring that up again. That one looked just like a real, like, chill pastime. What was that called? Land Slide? It was called Life Slide. Life, Life slide. slide. Now, I've been seeing this... I, I actually saw the developer post on Reddit that they were going to be at E3, which I thought was really cool. So they're they're a pretty small developing team, If and getting on there is pretty cool. It looks like it's also going to be... Uh, on Apple Arcade. Very nice. Yeah. So it looks like it may already be out there for a while. So I think it might be coming to other places, other consoles. Am I seeing that right? Let's see. Okay, I have the trailer up and ready to go whenever you guys want it. All right, let's go ahead and play it life slide, and we'll look into where it's coming out. Although. Oh, yeah, it says it right there. August 6th on Steam. So it's already on Apple Arcade, it looks like, but it's coming to other platforms in the next few months. Let's go and check out this trailer, because it's really good. I'm seeing Life Slide on Apple Arcade already, and it looks like it's already been out for a while. So I'm seeing the most a review of a year ago. So Life Slide's been out for a while. Mm-hmm. It looks like it's getting a kind of a graphical upgrade, and probably a lot of f- new features coming to Steam and PC on August 6th, which is pretty cool. See, isn't that just like such a simple concept, but when you add in like all the extras with what looked like um, boosts from the wind on mm-hmm. the airplane and then uh, just the beautiful graphics and landscape around it, it's just amazing what you can do with, you know, some imagination and 
some know-how. <laughs> Beautiful game based around a paper airplane. Yeah. Super simple concept. And that's what most games are when you, when you boil them down. It's, it's a concept that you had, and then as you implement it, you're like, oh, it'd be cool if we could do X, and then Y, and then with, that's a new concept, and then it's like, oh, we could do this and that, and then it all just builds on itself. Mm -hmm. But it almost always starts with something pretty simple. This is someone who wanted to fly paper airplanes. Yep. And they're like, oh, it's so much cooler if we add these in. And that beautiful atmosphere to look at while you're flying around only makes it better. Absolutely. So that's really, really cool. Let's go ahead and jump back into E3. I think we've got Freedom Games presentation coming up. Making games is like a real thing that you can do. <laughs> it's just so, that's the word is liberating. We own this project. No, we just ahead. want to make a fun game. E3 all the way. You have an idea of what the vision of it looks like, but then it actually coming out the other side looking like that, it's pretty rare. I co-founded the studio with uh, two of my friends. We had uh, all worked at a company that did not end up turning out like you know any of us had hoped. So coming out of that experience, the three of us, we wanted to do something that felt a little bit more authentic to who we were and what we liked. Going into it, we knew that we had complementary skill sets. Having the, the kind of the core pillars of, of game design already there and having experience, we were able to cover a lot of bases. This is really the first time we've been able to pour so much of ourselves into the development of a game. I think I'm most proud of us being able to look at this game and know that we're hitting our own quality bar, especially for our first game. You think you know everything and then at some point you go, oh wait, we didn't know how to do that part. Well, I guess we got to figure it out. <laughs> the four of us who started the studio worked in AAA. I left to go start making indie games. So we took that opportunity to kind of use our old friend group and our old expertise to start up The Wandering Band. And it was the first time that all of us felt complete creative control. That was fun, it was a challenge, it was also scary at the beginning. On a AAA team, you have technical artists and a dozen animators. I think the biggest challenge for us was trying to learn new skills and new parts of the game development process without ever doing it before. But I wouldn't trade it away. I think it's uh, the creativity and the creative freedom is totally worth it. the retro games. These were our favorites. And we tried to combine a lot of different elements from different games and give it a unique touch. A shout out to our community. They helped us translate the demo. They helped us get out the words. The demo has been played over a million times. It's just great to get a community like that. They helped us make Corman what it is.
I had lived in Kyoto for a while where I'd gone to a cat cafe and it was such a surreal experience for me at the time. So we sat down and we prototyped Cat Cafe Manager. When you're petting a cat, I don't know what it is, like endorphins that are being released, like the, the good feeling that you get from that. We kind of wanted to put in the game. We live in a time that's like pretty stressful and out of control in a lot of ways. So for us, it's very important that you sort of get a cozy feeling when you get introduced to the game. Just making the Cat Cafe of your dreams. I'm from a really rural town. So is Tanner, the other lead developer on the game. We've been together for since middle school, I guess. <laughs> yeah. There's no companies, right? There's no video game companies in Little Rock or the state of Arkansas. So we decided to just be the first. <laughs> to the Rescue is where you play as somebody working in a dog shelter and taking on all the responsibilities that entails. People love dogs so much, but this is also about raising awareness, right? It's, it's both of those things. There's diseases that can appear in the shelter. It's dirty and adopters only want the cutest puppies and they don't want the old dogs. Essentially, I just want people to walk away with more knowledge about the things we're representing. We've gotten a lot of people that work in real shelters that are like, I'm glad that you're doing this because a lot of people don't realize how hard the work is and how thankless it is. So 20% of every dollar that Little Rock Games makes from this game is going to be going to the Pet Finder Foundation. The game is about being hopeful that you can improve your community in some small way. I first started getting into games probably about seven or eight years old, tinkering around with game engines. I started putting games on the web, flash games and, and things like that. I always liked the idea of really silly deaths, characters getting blown to bits in like a cartoony way. Oh. It's usually an area of frustration, but when you can see your, your character's head just flying off and blood's going everywhere, it's like, <laughs> you just got nothing but humor there. Sure gonna feel bad in the morning. I come up with the idea of having like a Ninja Warrior slash Total Wipeout death competition. I was actually working two jobs at the same time as developing the game. I'd have all these fantastic ideas while I was there. You know, I'd be on the checkout just thinking about Slaughter League and by the time I get home, I'd just be like, uh, we ended up deciding that it would be best if I work full time on the game. This game, it sounds corny, but it's changed my life in that way. Whereas no other game had before. It's just flipped my life to where I want it to be. So to finally be able to do this as a job is just insane. I love it. This is definitely like a good, just relax, chill in the evening, play with buds, laugh at stupid stuff kind of game. Oh, oh this is sick. I was pretty laid back in college. I did just fine, but uh, I worked on Dark Deity. I didn't work on my own work. <laughs> None of us have ever worked on <laughs> games at all. So for the majority of development, we worked on it in the dorm, yeah. And we would sort of just sit in the dorm room, just like, you know, type of working away. Uh, I learned how to code. Maybe I should raise my rates. I have failed my 
people. Weakness has consequences. This would make for a fine tale. thought that I would be good at making video games. My mom just sent me a picture of a drawing I did when I was like eight titled My Own Game. I was diagnosed with Asperger's autism as a child, and I basically kind of just told myself, no, nah, th there's no way I could be in management. But through therapy as a child and then continuing my own efforts, I overcame it. Now I'm doing my dream, doing something I thought I couldn't do. Through this process, I've really learned how valuable people are. There's 20 people on the team. I'm just one of them. And I'm hoping to convey some of that through the game's narrative. You have to have growth and you have to have progress. So for us, with One Lonely Outpost, loneliness helps highlight the value of connection. It took us a long time to get here. We put a lot of hard work into it. Shipping games brings tough times, but we've also seen like success together. Success for us is defined as being able to continue to do this because we really love it. We want to be what we know and be the best at that. Making something that people enjoy. Thank you, Freedom Games, for that showcase. Passionate. All right, so that was a really great showcase by Freedom Games. Uh, a lot of gameplay there, a mm -hmm. lot of trailers that looked great. And, you know, they did it exactly how people viewing E3 wants to see it. They want to see game trailers, they want to see footage, they don't care as much about the eonic backstory, you know. Mm -hmm. Getting the developer input, uh, as Tyrion said, was really good, though. Like, that was getting really to special. hear the story of why they made it. Because each of those teams are fairly small. I think the largest one there was like 20 people mm -hmm. down to one. Yeah. And each of those teams had a reason for making it. Like the dog shelter, what was that? I wrote down all the names of them here so we can actually look at them later. Uh, the one called To the Rescue, where you manage a dog shelter. Mm -hmm. Like, that was a small team that wanted to raise awareness about what it's like getting dogs rescued and, and the thanklessness of that kind of work yeah but turning it into a fun game so that you can actually enjoy the enjoy doing it without having to pick up actual dog poop you know? exactly so i think that's i mean i think that's really really cool and getting to actually hear that is a big deal so that's awesome yeah uh freedom games 
It looks like they are the publisher. They are the ones uh, maybe helping these developers get on there. I'm kind of curious. There's other ones like this. I think Team 17 is also one of them. Um, they are. Uh, they publish your game. They help you get it out there. They provide some funding necessarily. Have you heard of Frida Games before? This? Before this? No. I have looked into some of them, but this looks like... Uh, Looks like their first big debut. So I'm looking at their games. Let's see. Let's take a look. So they've got, on their website, they have a ton of games. But it looks like almost all of them are ones that are coming out soon. So there are yeah. a few that are out. Uh, I did not see Ruin Raiders or God Strike in or Jetboard Joust. Or, Yeah. But everything else, it looks like, is actually coming out, and that's what they were talking about at this at this E3. Yeah. So it looks like they're relatively new, but they've got a lot of really great games coming out. Tyrion, find one lonely outpost again. Okay, this is going to be a huge game. This one's going to be huge, and it had it drew a lot of attention in the E3 chat box as well. Yeah. If we could invest in a game that we've seen so far, I think this would probably be it. This looks like a sci-fi Stardew Valley. Yep. And Stardew Valley is huge. Even now, it is still huge. It has sold millions of copies. It is on almost every... I think it is on every single playable platform. Yeah. It's on mobile, Switch, yeah, Xbox, PlayStation, PC. Uh, I don't think it's going to be on the Intellivision Amico, but that's not that big of a loss. don't think it's going to be on <laughs> VR either, but... <laughs> I would not be surprised if it came to VR eventually. But yeah, it's on pretty much everything you can play games on. So, One Lonely Outpost was just shown. Let's look at this again, because this trailer looked really great. And, Tyrion, did you, were you able to find something? Yeah. Okay, bring this up. I think this is going to be a big game. Unfortunately, it does not come out soon enough. Welcome to One Lonely Outpost, a sci-fi farming sim where you will customize your character, then arrive on a desolate, barren planet as the first and only colonist. As you build up your farm, you make it possible for other people to arrive. People who are shy and clumsy, People who are fun and quirky. And some plain old weird dudes. As people come to your colony, a town builds. And maybe you'll find someone in it to share your journey with. But growing a successful farm is never easy, not even in the future. You'll have the alien weather to contend with. And your crops will need tending. You also have choices to make. Do you go with an all-natural organic path, or do you take advantage of all the future has to offer, and maybe end up with some very strange crops? Try some fishing. Or cook up a bite to eat for a boost. 
or enter the mines for some precious minerals. While exploring, find ancient alien ruins with robots who want to test you. And maybe you'll find out just how this planet came to be, and how far you can take its future. Join us on One Lonely Outpost. Alright, so that was the Kickstarter trailer they had, which showed a little more than what we saw on E3 there. Yeah. Uh, it looks really cool. I hope they have multiplayer. It doesn't look like it. And I'm sure we can probably look at some more details. But this game looks great. <laughs> it does. I've played a lot of Stardew myself. My wife plays it a ton. Like, a ridiculous amount. This game is going to be on my TV screen, on the Switch, Very soon. day and night, as soon as it launches. Which the launch date looks to be 2022, right? Yeah, it was like a year away. Yeah, so it's still a ways away. That's unfortunate. But, uh, yeah, that was a really great uh, showcase from Freedom Games. You can check out their website, freedom.gg. And they've got a lot. They've got all their games on there. So we looked at One Lonely Outpost, but then they also have Dark Deity, To the Rescue, Sands of Aura, Dreamscaper, Cat Ca Cafe Manager, Airborne Kingdom, Slaughter League... Uh, Tower Rush and even more so Freedom Games has a lot coming out in the next probably year to two and that's awesome more games coming out especially from indie developers is always a great thing I don't know much about Freedom Games but I really liked their presentation it was well done the developers got to speak their part mm -hmm. the games look high quality I've heard of Coromon before. Uh, that was one that I didn't actually list, I don't think. But I've heard of Coromon, like the kind of the Pokemon uh, inspired game, heavily inspired by it's Pokemon. Very much like it. And I've heard good things about it. So I'm pretty excited about this lineup. Uh, the next thing on E3's list is Ven's origin stories with Hector Rodriguez. Now we're not quite sure what that is. Ven looks like a entertainment slash gaming network channel. Uh, we're going to take a quick break, and we're going to come back and check that out. If it's interesting, then we'll watch it together. If not, we'll compile a long list of trailers for you to just watch and enjoy that E3 has shown so far. See you guys in a little bit. Courage, another friend of mine is along, alongside Valkyrie, uh, who is an amazing figure in esports, becoming, uh, you know, co-CEOs in the company as well. 100 Thieves have just done incredible work in esports, and I give them a lot of credit for yeah. what they've done. No, no, no. I mean, honestly, I feel like they've paved the way for so many orgs. I feel like a lot of orgs model their formula of how to approach all these different things, like you well, were saying, merch the and the content yeah, creators. Yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 Um, but anyway, it, it's absolutely fascinating, and I'd love to hear more about it. So for more on the Nade Shot 100 Thieves, and what's next? Here's a special E3 edition and the origin story series from our friends at Ben. My name is Hector Rodriguez, but you might know me as Hex. I know a lot of people in gaming and esports, and I will be bringing them into the studio to share their origin stories. Three words that best describe you. Optimistic. Introspective. Whoa, you just put me on the spot like that. It's really about cracking the code, and that's the same approach that I had with FaZe Clan, right? It's like, here's this thing that is so special that nobody knows. When I walked into the job, this is sacred space. Yeah. Uh-uh, I am a guest here. I'm here to try and help 
align things, motivate, set new visions, get more people involved. I didn't start it, I didn't create it. You know, this has to be a very respectful entry into this party. I'm like, yo, what do you want from me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were three years in and four months. Yeah. And people were talking about, yo, why have you won a championship? You know how hard it is to win in League of Legends? Join us on Venn for new episodes, behind the scenes moments, and much, much more. Esports is 1,000% going to contend with traditional sports yeah. and viewership, which means dollar bills, y'all. Origin stories. Bro, this is Matt. Hi, Hi Matt. Matt. How you doing? Good, good. Um, let's do me a favor. So what's going to happen is Hector will introduce you. Yeah. You'll sit down. You better give me the best <laughs> introduction I've I can't ever even had. wait to hear the intro. The prodigal this son. This dude, he knows. Well, that was just me in the back and <laughs> I'm super excited. I'm getting mic'd up right now. I'm about to interview somebody that I've interviewed like a hundred times, but I'm gonna try to make it super interesting by asking him questions and talking about shit that we haven't really ever talked Here. about in public. There he is. Oh, I'm sweating. I am sweating. I and I have to pee. Welcome back to another episode of Origin Stories here on Venn. My name is Hector Rodriguez. I am your host. Today, I have the honor, the pleasure, the true pleasure, actually, to introduce my little brother, someone who's near and dear to my heart, Mr. Nate Schott, Matt Haig, CEO of 100 Thieves. I mean, you do it all, baby. Why don't you come in and sit You're down? You're about to say optic Nate Schott. You got, you got really close to saying optic Nate Schott. I almost did say you optic Nate Schott. Yeah, I did. Did you catch that? I did catch it. Uh, usually, I like to start out this show by asking you three questions and then another question, but the main one is three words that best describe you. Uh, three words that describe me? Whoa, you just put me on the spot like that. All right, three words that describe 100 Thieves. Mm, that one's tough, too. That one's tough, too. Let me think. Can you describe anything in three words? No. Okay. No, I'm not good at descriptive adjectives. Oh. Uh, let me see. Give me, give me two seconds. Let me spitball something that's... Well, because I, I don't like using three words because I, like, I'm confident in myself and I don't want to sound pompous, you know yeah. what I mean? No, you're in good company, babe. I would say goofy, uh -huh. impatient, yes. and squirrely. <laughs> squirrely. Squirrely's good. My, I'm, I'm That's what you always called me, so. Yeah, but nah, it wasn't nah. because you were like, your brain was elsewhere, it's just because at, like at the time you did. Chubby cheeks. Yeah, at the time, but now mm -hmm. you've grown into a handsome man. Thank you. Uh, who knows you better than anyone else? I would say... If you asked me that question like eight years ago, I'd say you, uh, when we were living in the Optic House. But now I have to give it to my girlfriend, Haley. Yeah. I mean, Haley can read all my emotions really well. And yeah. she's very patient and she tolerates me. Yeah. Because she knows that sometimes I get angry and sometimes I get sad. And sometimes I have a range of emotions where she is always just like that even yeah. keeled. You know what to expect. And I know how she's going to react when I am reacting to something. Mm -hmm. So I'd say Haley knows me best. We've been together for two years. So obviously, I've, I've known you for over 15 years. Years, I think now. Mm -hmm. Oh my God! How old were you when we met? Okay. 2008, Call of Duty 4. Call of Duty 4. That's right. You weren't in Gears of War. In two, I, my first event was MLG Chicago 2007. St. Charles. St. Charles. Yeah. What the hell? How'd you know that? I know everything. Uh, were you there? I was not. Do you know I got my ass beat? I almost made it to championship bracket, top 16. We would have been considered a pro player. Yeah. We lost to Gringo Jr., who was like an eight-year-old kid. Oh, dude, uh, he he was like in during Call of Duty 2. I heard about that dude. Yeah, kid was nasty. Yeah, he was. Pieced us up on mansion execution last round. It was tied 3-3, first of four. I'll never forget the round. Yeah. Made a call, did not pan out. How many times a day do you say 100 thieves or 100 or 100 thieves or 100 T? I guess I say 100 Thieves a lot. a lot. 100 Thieves, 100 Thieves, 100 Thieves. Yeah. I was doing like a PR tour for Excedrin. Uh, we had a partnership to make people aware of a uh, mindfulness routine that can help you reduce headaches. And uh, every, everybody on that call kept saying 100 Thieves and it was driving me nuts. Yeah. We talked to like 30 different outlets in four hours this morning. They yeah. all said 100 Thieves. I didn't correct them. Yeah. You're I didn't like, want to be that guy. Just 100 Thieves. 100 Thieves, 100 Thieves, 100 Thieves. 100 thieves. Yeah. Let's go back to the earliest memory that you have. Born in Chicago, Illinois, lived in uh, Palos... Palos Hills. Palos Hills. Uh, does your dad still live at the same crib? Uh, he built the house that we grew up in, in Palos Hills, and then after my mom passed, I think there were just too many bad memories in the house, so he yeah. sold it and moved to a nice part of town, which was like 20 minutes away. It's called Orland Park. Okay. And now Very he familiar. moved again um, to a city called Lyle. So it, it's tough, man. I, I wish I could go back to that house to kind of like face some of the fears that I had from the stuff that I saw with my mom, but mm -hmm. 
I'm glad that I can still go back to Chicago. I'm bummed that you guys went to Texas because that was always like my saving grace. All right, I go see my pops, yeah. go hang out with Optic. That was that was great. But my earliest memory, that's kind of tough. I think uh, one of my earliest memories was probably my dad. He he would have to reside the house every couple years because of the material that he used to build it. And he had scaffolding built up the side of the, you know this two-story home. And I was playing on it like a jungle gym, but little did I know that a wasp was started nesting inside the, the scaffolding itself. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so like four or five of them came out and stung me all at one time in my hand, and I've been terrified of flying bugs ever since. How old were you? I don't know. I was young. <laughs> like, like, were you a teenager or were no, you like no, a no, no, toddler? No, no, no. I was younger than that. Like seven, eight? I was probably like eight, nine, ten. Were you crying? Yeah. Balling my eyes out. I cried a lot as a kid. Did you? Yeah. I, I was a very I, emotional young man. I, I think I cried a lot up until like I was four years old. And that's, that's what my parents told me. It's like, it wasn't until I was able to hit someone that I like I cried because I didn't know how to release that anger. But once I learned how to punch walls and, you know, things, I started doing that in the bed. Yeah, I didn't get angry. I got sad. I was, I was telling Lee Trink the story about me being in uh, in Mexico as a you know for my my school as a Catholic school, Juarez. yeah, and how the nuns would grab me from the hair here, and then they were just like like seriously jerk it like so I was like oh my god that hurt yeah yeah because they were just disciplinary so my, both of my parents were actually disciplinary my dad was super strict you know him a uh, very quiet dude but that's because of that and my mom was just like you know super like da -da. yeah. And, and I still became like what I became. Just, like, I didn't <laughs> yeah. give a shit. Like they hurt. I would pretend like they, they it hurt, but I'd be like, ah, like, don't, don't hurt. It don't hurt. <laughs> I would look at the wall or my teddy bear. Yeah, like, I love that. But I think that's what I appreciated actually a lot. Getting to hang out with you. You were like ten years older than me when we first started hanging out. And I always loved uh, your mentality around other people. Like you just like very tough exterior. Um, and that was something I could appreciate because my dad was a great dad. I love my dad. Dad's yeah. my hero. But there was a lot of things that you know. Not, I don't want to say, because we're not in the streets in Schaumburg of Illinois, but just, like, seeing how you interact with individuals. If somebody doesn't talk to you right, you kind of let them know that they weren't talking to you the right way. Yeah, yeah, And that was, I don't like confrontation, and that was stuff that I wouldn't do. But now that I'm older and yeah. a lot more confident in myself, <laughs> like, I feel like I picked up some tendencies from you. Do you wish that you could go back to a certain situation and be like, yo, my man? All the time, brother, all yeah. the time, do man. You, do you have one that you can recall right now? Man, I, I mean, well, what's the situation? Like, am I... Do I have the knowledge that I do of where I'm going to be in life? No, you're just you. I was just me? Yeah. Nah, I mean, I didn't have <laughs> shit on for me. Like, who, who am I going to step up to, bro? Yeah. I was like, bro, I had to get testosterone shots as a kid. Did you know that? No. I, I was I'm not even in the percentile of growth, so they were worried that I wasn't going to be on track to be a certain height or a certain weight. So uh, freshman year, bro, I weighed like 85 pounds, and so I was like what? four foot eight. So were you like a like a good kid, bad kid? Did you get in trouble? Were you the class clown? What kind of kid were you? No, I wasn't the class clown. I, I, dude, I've told people this before, but I was a super timid kid. I mean, I, I was really bad in social situations. I didn't know how to make friends. Um, I mean, I had friends in grade school and I, like going into high school, but my first job at McDonald's is like what really helped me come out of my shell and start learning how to talk to people yeah. and not be so afraid. But yeah, I wasn't a class clown. I kind of just like stayed to the side and I wanted attention. I know that for a fact, like, I just took this narcissism test. I'm like right in the middle. I'm like a 18 out of 40. Are you? I thought I'd be way more narcissistic than that. Yeah. What do you think mine would be? My score. I think you'd probably be like a 28. Is that bad? Uh, is that 40 is the highest. 40 is the highest. You know Jackson from 100 Thieves? He got a 33. Jackson got a 33. The, he's the definition of a narcissist. Yeah. But yeah, either way, I was like a, just a quiet kid. Play sports? Yeah. Baseball. Baseball. Basketball. B team. <laughs> I was terrible at that. I was too short, man. I didn't have any athletic ability. Yeah? yeah. I mean, so was Muggsy Bugs, I think. He Second was... baseman, fourth through eighth grade, though, all-stars every year. Really? Yeah. Uh, if you can hang your hat yeah, on I, that. I can, I can. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I've seen the pictures. Or I've seen the one picture of you as, a, like, a baby with a, with a bat. Yeah. Just, like, chubby cheeks. Bro, that was me in, like, seventh grade. <laughs> no, you were not. <laughs> nah, I'm playing. Oh, I was, my God. I, I Bro, know. I literally thought that that was true. And I'm like, man, you had to look like you're, you're like, seven. Yeah. I remember clearly, by the way, the first day that I heard your voice when we were playing on Vacant with Diesel and somebody else. You were playing with somebody else. 
But I remember, and I'm like, I'm like, damn, this has got a deep ass voice. No, you yeah. go back and watch my old videos. I sound like a. No, I, I don't know why, but you sounded like I don't know. You were talking like a grown dude. Must have been the testosterone shots. May have been. I didn't grow this myself. No, no, no. Uh, but but I remember that clearly. What do you, when when do you think was the first time that we met? Well, I mean, I could tell you the the story how we, you and I met, but I don't know if you want that on camera with optic nerve. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, go. Well, so we were one of the better competitive teams uh, in Modern Warfare 2. We were actually, we won the first three major tournaments uh, in Modern Warfare 2. And then Optic reached out to this guy named Optic Nerve, who no longer works there. I mean, he wasn't even working there much longer after no. I no. joined. But uh, he basically said, yeah, we're looking for a competitive team right now. We make YouTube videos and we make money off of it. And my mind was blown. I'm, I'm like, wait, what? Wait, wait, hold on. Back up, back up. Because I, I had posted like clips to my YouTube channel of me clutching 1B3s on Crossfire, Search and Destroy, yeah. all these old school yeah. gameplays from game battles. Uh, so when I found out you guys can make money from videos, that's when I, I, I don't know why. Because I don't think I've ever had that level of motivation for anything in my life besides that. Yeah. As soon as I heard that, it was, uh, you know, let's let's blow the hinges off this thing and let's go. Yeah. So that's, and I got introduced to you. I think I was really scared to talk to you. I think we hopped in a Skype call and, yo, know, you were kind of an asshole, to be honest. Yeah. You, you, you wanted no business talking to me. Uh, you were just very short. Yeah. Like, who the f is this guy? No, I knew who you were. I just didn't want to have anything to do with you at the time. Yeah, I'm so, no, that, I, seriously though, that's what the tough part was. Is that what was. it felt? Well, like, because Optic was so tight-knit back then, I felt like I had to be in your good graces to yeah. really feel a part of it, but I was only close with, like, Diesel and, uh, and Predator. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Predator I, was I, the I think OG. That that's, I mean, still to this day, I think that that's what, how Optic is, right? Like, it's, there's, it's literally the same group of guys since the beginning. The first time somebody meets you, they gotta approach you the right way. Because if they don't, I think you write them off immediately. Yeah. All right, so let's get back to the origin story. Take me through the competitive years so of 2010 through 2012. It's pretty broad, man. Yeah, 2012, 2010 is what? Uh, Modern Warfare 2? 2010 and 2012, no, nothing happened. Nothing notable besides, oh, Cod XP. Yeah, 2011, Cod XP. Cod XP, we won that event, $100,000. You just made 100 grand. How does that feel? I don't want to work at McDonald's anymore. <laughs> You guys end up winning, and again, I knew that we were gonna win it. I don't know how, but I remember that the moment that you guys won, I was in the middle of the crowd, and Jericho, uh, Gold Glove, uh, Doctor Disrespect at the time, or you know, guy, he, he wasn't in custom, uh, guy and Bashir, Bashir Musa and T Martin were all there. Bash? Yeah, Bash. Yeah. From there, let's jump through 2013, uh, Black Ops 2. Yeah. You're blowing up for the first time ever after only sponsoring uh, people in Halo 3. Here comes Red Bull. Oh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So that was really the biggest moment, is I flew out to L.A. I was staying at the Gamer Shore House, which was Jericho Syndicate and Gold Glove. And uh, I was going out there to sign a contract with Red Bull, at, at part of their athlete program, because I grew up watching Wall Street was sponsored by Red Bull, and to me that seemed like the coolest thing ever. Same. And I, spent, I sent them a DM when I was still living at my parents' house, yeah. like a year prior, like, hey, I'm really interested in Red Bull and working with you guys. Do you have any plans of getting in Call of Duty? And that's when I met a guy named Sam Keen, who's still friends with to this day. Great guy. Yeah. And uh, they flew me out later that year, 2012, signed the contract. And when I got back, that's when Black Ops 2 and live streaming, it seemed as if every day after I returned from L.A. with the Red Bull hat on, it was 1,000 viewers, 2,000 viewers, 3,000 viewers, just climbing and climbing and yeah. climbing. That was when I caught my break. Yeah. Uh, all right, so, so walk me through your decision to, one, retire, and then ultimately leave Optic. Yeah, I was going back and forth to L.A., and Fwiz, who's the head of gaming at YouTube, who you and I are both really, really close with one of our best friends, he was always convincing me, or trying to convince me, to spend some time in L.A., just to broaden my horizons, try something new. So, yeah, I mean, all look, right, so dude, when right you're... What they're doing is an interview with some people, basically, yeah. Sounds kind of boring, so we're not going to cover that. Instead, we're just going to play with you or play all the trailers <laughs> that have been coming out so far on E3. Something much more interesting to watch. So we've compiled the list of all the best trailers that have come out today and in the last couple days as well. We're just going to run those through until the next event, which is at two thirty, and is going to be Capcom, which should be pretty good. Yes. After that is a Razor event, which is probably just going to be merch. Maybe they'll show some games, although I highly doubt it. So 
Expect 2.30 to around 3 o'clock to be the end of our stream today, but we're just going to play the best trailers for you. That way you can find them all right here, right now. Tyrion, go ahead. Kiwi is a game about two kiwi birds who work at the post office. Their names are Jeff and Deborah. I'm Joel, I'm one of the developers on Kiwi, and I'm going to show you how a kiwi level changes over the course of the game. So in this room you're transcribing urgent messages and assembling them ransom note style by stamping them onto the page with your butts. You'll come back to this room every so often throughout the game, but there will always be a new twist to change things up. So as summer turns to autumn, now your word fragments are moving around on conveyor belts, and you'll need to chop certain words in half with the descrambler to get the pieces you need. Jeff and Deborah are going to have to deal with all kinds of hazardous work conditions. They've got sandstorms during the summer, male fly swarms. These guys have no respect for personal property. Paranormal activity. This is genuine footage of an actual haunting. In winter, the post office gets hit with a huge blizzard, and now this level becomes about sharing the warmth of a single tiny lantern to break through blocks of ice and keep each other from becoming kiwi sickles. Our little heroes are gonna face new challenges every level and in every room of the post office, whether they're typing telegrams or packaging shipping crates or helping an octopus sort the mail. It's all in a day's work for Jeff and Deborah. Also, you can dress up your kiwis, so don't say we never did nothing for you. We're releasing Kiwi on August 31st for PC and all major consoles, and we hope to see you at the post office. Thanks for watching. Się, że to, co designerzy sobie wymyślają, to jest pisanie listu miłosnego. Każdy kiedyś był zakochany, pisał list miłosny, wydawało mu się, że to jest takie piękne, wspaniałe, a potem po latach znajdował te listy i mówił, Jezus Maria, co ja tu za bzdury pisałem. Zaczynaliśmy właściwie od gry, gdzie skupialiśmy się na przerywaniu, na menedżowaniu swoim czasem i towarzyszami. To wszystko wydawało się po designersku dobre, ale zwykle emocjonalnie dosyć nudne. I dlatego dodawaliśmy coraz więcej elementów, które angażowały gracza, które były dla niego ciekawe. Na początku był to taki mały chat, który gracz sobie mógł modyfikować, ale był całkowicie opcjonalny. Z biegiem gry on stawał się coraz bardziej sensem gry, coraz bardziej jego sercem nadawaliśmy coraz większą rolę naszym towarzyszom i warto im było dać właśnie tą walkę, coraz więcej potworów, coraz więcej możliwości, coraz więcej broni. Absolutnie normalnym jest, że zaczyna się z czymś zupełnie innym niż to, z czym się kończy. Product not yet rated.
Four brothers, bound by eternal purpose. They all broke at the same time. And a girl named Mo. She knows what must be done. When the blight first came, people began to panic. And now, the spores are taking hold of whatever remains. Mo's family is still here, however. She has been tasked to protect them. After all, she is the bearer of the Omni Switch. violence. Can you tell us a bit more about the video you just saw in the PC Gaming Show? The video presented in the PC Gaming Show brings you closer to Aiden's story. What he's looking for, what motivates him, how he ends up in the city and of course what happened in the old franchise between both games. This is a bunch of important information about the old 2 story. Okay, so we know more about the main storylines from the mentioned video. How does the game look outside the core campaign? Side quests are an important part of world building in Dying Light 2. Through these quests you can decide how the city will look like thanks to the city alignment system or bring new opportunities for the citizen. A great example is an opera singer that Timon mentioned in developer's AMA. Some citizens will support your decisions, some of them will not. But it's up to you to decide how the city should look like. We have uh, a lot of game activities prepared for our players, but at this stage we want it to be a surprise for you. How seamless is the co-op experience? Would you say that the best way to experience Dying Light 2 is with a friend? It could be. What is cool about the co-op is that it gives you an opportunity to see how the world changes when your friends make different decisions than you. In co-op you can walk in their shoes to experience all those differences. But really there is no just one way to play Dying Light 2. It's up to you guys. How are you improving the story for Dying Light 2? I know we all have great fun killing infected, but we also want to give you a deep, thought-provoking experience that will let you be immersed in the DL2 world for long hours. On top of that, thanks to the choices and consequences mechanics, the story will be shaped differently depending on the way you play. You've promised a great open world that feels alive. How is it going? Uh, yeah, well, as you can imagine, Dying Light 2 is full of infected, but it's also full of humans with their everyday life activities and purposes. We are building Dying Light 2 around a simple rule. Ground is death and rooftops are life. What is cool is that NPCs act differently on each of those levels. Also, their behavior depends on choices you make and the way you play. For centuries and longer, rats have fought tirelessly to repel the incessant frog invasions. Peace was only ever short-lived, until finally a young monarch rose to power. King Rattus, first of his name, unified the rat kingdoms under one rule, repelling Greenwort and his kind back to the putrid swamps from whence they came. Crops prospered, families flourished, and the magnificent Crimson Keep climbed ever higher toward the sky. But as time passed, 
King Redis the Savior grew old, and the kingdom vulnerable once more. His people grew anxious, some claiming to perceive a faint odor in the air. Greenwort had returned with a ferocious vengeance, amassing an army of unfathomable scale. He burned everything in his path towards the Crimson Keep. King Rattus gazed down upon his withered claws, barely able to hold the crown. He had little hope of wielding a sword, so it was decided the crown should pass to Whiskers new. Arise, young prince, for the kingdom needs a hero. And so, your tale begins. is one thing, but protecting the whole town? That's a lot. Take that! I'll get straight to it. Tomorrow. Today, I rest. I look forward to working together, as colleagues and as rivals. Introducing Two Point Compass.
When we're thinking about what we're going to do next, campus and the idea of running a university or a college was something we just kept coming back to. It's a really rich topic. So people who haven't probably heard of Two Point Studios may think, oh, schools, that's really dull. Well, hospitals, if you've seen our previous game, isn't about healthcare really. It's a wrapper, you know, we call it Two Point Hospital, but that's about as close as it gets to the real world of medical uh, healthcare. Campus is taking everything we learned from Two Point Hospital and taking it to the next level. The important thing was for us to give the player a canvas that they could completely create themselves. In campus, you start with this blank plot of land. We've got something called the, uh, the Smart Brush, for example, which allows you to drag uh, interesting shaped pathways. If you want to drag a, a, a picket fence, you can drag that along. It's just really easy to paint the world you want. So it's really simple to drag out a courtyard, um, lay down some paths at different angles. And it's fun, isn't it? I mean, it's, it, it's adding this kind of city builder element to, to Two Point Universe. The difference between Two Point Hospital and campus is that we're spending a much longer period with, with our students. What we wanted to do with campus is make you care about your university. You know, the, the idea of these interesting and different courses are going to attract interesting and different students. So there's a night school, horrible pun, but night school, you got it. You're going to train knights of the realm. Uh, so it won't be stuffy, normal, boring stuff that made you go to sleep at school. It's going to be really cool, interesting stuff. Robert Conway, 22nd of June, 1954. I've solved many a case in my time as a private investigator, but nothing so close to home as the abduction of Charlotte May. There are some things that take hold of a person and refuse to let go. For me, it's the idea of saving that little girl. My own daughter, Catherine, is on the case. She has the same look in her eye that I used to have. There'll be no stopping her. I wish I could say that all of my neighbors are innocent. I wish I could say that I have the faintest clue where to begin. There's a lot I wish I could say. The truth is, sometimes it takes a nightmare to wake a place like Daily of You.
coordinates for Sector 4, and drop. What was that? One of the squids has a hold of the arc! It's pulling us back down! Auxiliary boosters aren't functioning. Main thrusters disabled. All systems are shutting down. I used to feel so much peace, staring into the heavens, until a piece of it fell. And the nightmare began. We thought it could be contained. It evolved. So we did too. One of our own is MIA. I need an extraction team, now. If there's a way to stop them, you will find it. But I know you will find me first. Okay, the plan. Nomad, secure our exit. I'll take out the nests. And I'll find the banner. I have your signal. Let's go. We are already out of the nests. Incoming! Clear the area! <laughs>
throwing me a party? <laughs> yeah. Too bad you missed all the fireworks. Team, it's Ash. We're not done yet. VIP down and... Seekers, this is the Riders Ridge, the Republic's stomping ground. From here, you can meet like minded riders, manage your career, learn to nail those wild moves, stay stylish, share your creations with the Republic, stay on top of the latest news and take up some ferocious multiplayer action like Free For All or Trix Battle, our six versus six team competition. So, here's how it works. Performing big tricks on the modules will turn them from red to blue, and every trick that you stomp will contribute to your team's overall score. You still with me? Okay. When your team has turned all the modules blue, you capture that district, which will help multiply your score into the big time. Progress, progress, progress. To unlock more content, you gotta earn those stars. So, if you wanna be the boss of your own career, the world's most famous competitions are waiting for you. Now, some might say the best parts of the Republic can be found in the city playground. We've got modules that you can slay for days. Maybe you're all about living on the edge. Either way, to progress, you've got to earn those stars. Having the right rig is important, too. We've all got our preferences. All right, I get it. Sometimes you just want to explore and bathe in nature. That's right, everything you do counts. Getting those stars means more rad to be had, and the Republic will abide. There's always something awesome to do as you reach new milestones and unlock more challenges. Ha <laughs> ha It's the Red Bull Joyride, people. It's infamous, it's spectacular, it's the biggest stage of slopestyle mountain biking, and guess what? You can play it versus your friends. There is so, so much more. More stunts. More sports. More events. Just more, okay? And the natural outdoor playground for you and your friends to enjoy any way that you want. When we say fun with everyone, we mean it. Look at all these riders. Does this speak to you? Then don't miss out on mass races. <laughs> Woo! Awaits you 
Rider. See you soon.
been a long time, Michael. I heard you were back in town. But I don't remember sending you an invitation. I'd kill you myself. But where's the fun in that? No, Michael. I'm gonna roll out the red carpet for you. <laughs> I got the intel. Good. Now take it to the uplink. The base rolled blind. Target is marked. Oh, thanks. Ciao. So, remind me, what's the deal with this intel? I guess I'll kill you now. The drone is down. The drone is mine. Job, you know, the heist, larceny. Larceny? More like.
Once upon a time, our lands teemed with creatures great and small. The beauty of the worlds was unrivaled. The people thrived and lived in harmony with the land around them. But this harmony was not to last. Slowly, without much notice, the withering was creeping out from the darkness. Once it took hold, there was little that could be done. Our lands were overrun, and all that was cherished disappeared before us. But all was not lost. One young, brave soul stayed behind. With support from their friends and with boundless determination, This young soul seeks out a way to push back the withering and bring life back to our world. Grow, Song of the Ever Tree. This is a very different world. Hi, I'm Rich Newbold, Game Director at Frontier Developments. So as you may have seen earlier at the PC Game Show, we're working on Jurassic World Evolution 2. We're really excited about it and we're looking forward to creating the most authentic Jurassic experience yet. We've got tons of new features across four different game modes including our original Jurassic campaign, which is a story set after the events of Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom. You're going to be leading efforts to contain, control and conserve all those dinosaurs now running out in the wild. You'll be working alongside characters from the films, voiced by original talent, such as Jeff Goldblum. And in the game, we have over 75 prehistoric species. We've got new dinosaurs, we have returning community favorites, and we've added flying and marine reptiles to the game. I'm really thrilled to be showing you a first look at footage from the game itself. This is a from our species field guide series of videos focusing on one of the many prehistoric species we have in the game. This is an iconic popular dinosaur, it's the Triceratops, but we're showing you it in a new environment never seen before in Jurassic World Evolution. I hope you enjoy it and are looking forward to the game releasing later this year. The Triceratops is one of the most recognizable herbivores to ever have existed. It is best known for its trio of facial horns. These adornments are not just for display purposes. The brow horns in particular can inflict considerable damage to any dinosaur that dares to provoke it. Coming later in 2021, Esports Boxing Club brings you the greatest fight roster in video game history. With over 200 fighters already signed, we've got some of the biggest and most anticipated the names. Of all time. From the absolute legends of the sport to the most exciting names in boxing today. The first women's division ever represented in a video game and the hottest new talent. But what about the game? Let's take a closer look at the next-gen visuals and gameplay that are set to make ESBC the greatest of all time. It's good, it's definitely one for the grandkids and stuff to say, like your old granddad was in a game and busting people up, so aye, it's, uh, it's gonna be quite cool. So the movement system in ESBC is all about fluidity, being able to create angles, recreating mannerisms from boxes. The physics system doesn't just rely on animation. This allows us to recreate realistic knockdowns. Even when a fighter is unsteady on their feet, it's not purely animation based. Now we've had professional boxers, professional coaches come into the studio and provide input through motion capture, and actually reviewing the game during its development. 
and now we really feel like we've created a true representation of the sport. Presentation is important to us, just because we are in the studio, we're still going to aim high when it comes to production values. Esports Boxing Club coming to PC and all major consoles with early access in 2021. Product not yet rated. My name's Max Rea. I'm the founder of Black Matter and the lead developer of Hell Let Loose. Hell Let Loose began as the idea of a couple of hobbyist game developers all the way back in 2015. Following a successful Kickstarter, we launched into early access in the middle of 2019. And since then, we've delivered nine enormous updates, including entire systems overhauls, six new maps, tons of new weapons, gadgets, and vehicles, as well as expanding our unique real-time strategy-inspired metagame. As a result, we've been fortunate to sell more than a million copies during our first year of early access. 2021 is only going to be bigger. I'm excited to announce that we're launching out of early access on July the 27th, with the introduction of the Soviet forces on the Eastern Front, including famous battles like Kursk and Stalingrad, before we close out the year by bringing Hell Let Loose to next generation consoles. Hell Let Loose has only grown due to the vibrant community that surrounds it, from our earliest Kickstarter backers to our newest recruits. We're excited to introduce you to this ever evolving and expanding World War II experience. We hope you enjoy this first look at what's to come. Hello, my name is Heroes Herman, CEO of Iron. A game dev studio based in Croatia, and for the past few years we have been working on the Red Sources 2 game. It is a real-time tactical battlefield game. It supports up to 8 players and has a full playable co-op campaign. We are ready to show you the launch trailer now, so get ready for June 17, when the game launches on Steam, and uh, have fun blasting some new things. You are the executor. A high-class commanding officer with advanced cybernetic capabilities. You were awakened to lead a secret task force that will counter the threat of Stroll mutants and liberate Mars. Back, Executor. The Stroll infestation has now infected all colonies on Mars. Build your squad from six unique classes of elite soldier, utilizing their skills to best suit each mission type. Customize their weapons and tech, as well as their upgrades and abilities. Take command on the battlefield using the command radio to give orders to the whole squad or individual soldiers. Concentrate fire on targeted locations and carry out supply runs even during the heat of battle. Recruit your friends to the fight and join in up to eight player co-op missions to save Mars in our name. I'm Dylan from Gameus, and it's great to be here at the Future Game Show. We're currently getting very close to finishing Lake, a game that's set in the 80s. You play as Meredith Weiss, who takes a break from her life in the big city to deliver mail in her hometown. It's a job you can do at your own leisure, 
and you will get to know the people in Providence Oaks along the way. Today, we're excited to share an example of an activity after your workday is done. Movie Night with Angie from the video store. This is fun! It's been ages since I've been to the movies. Well, they call it the movies, plural. But of course, we can only see one movie at a time. So, which one will it be? My pick? Alright, let's see. Big Trouble in Little China, Blue Velvet, or The Great Mouse Detective. Alright, I'm ready to pick. The Great Mouse Detective. <laughs> Wouldn't have picked you for a Disney fan. Oh well, let's get in touch with our inner child. <laughs> We won't spoil more, and we also can't say what Meredith will do after spending two weeks in Providence Oaks, because it's all up to you. Lake is coming first to Xbox and PC this September 1st. Thanks for watching, and enjoy the rest of the show. In the beginning, there was dust. And from that dust, the moon was born. Eons of idleness passed, before suddenly it shattered. Great celestial chunks cascaded from the heavens unto Earth. From one prodigious shard spawned humanity, and from another, the gods. For a great many years, balance endured until a foul and malevolent deity intervened. Exil spread greed and distrust among his kin, compelling these calamitous beings to conquer man. Centuries of servitude passed, until finally, aided by a veiled ally, humanity revolted. The Great Crusade overthrew the old gods, imprisoning them within the sacred walls of the citadel. At the expense of untold lives, a peace was wrought, but it was not meant to last, for the miscreant Exil returned from his concealment, conducting atrocious experiments upon his caged kindred. A darkness permeated the lands. Rivers stagnated, crops failed, and the world of man began to fade. The great moon, witnessing all, wept a final shard. A shard of the purest obsidian. And thus, a glimmer of hope remains. Hi there, thanks for tuning in. Hopefully our little trailer has got you interested. My name's Tom, and I'm part of the team at Darkflow Software behind our new game, Enlisted, a historical World War II shooter with some unique gameplay quirks. One of Enlisted's most unique features is the Squads Mode, where you head into battle with a squad of AI soldiers under your control. You can instruct them on how to react to enemies, and most importantly, you can switch between any of them seamlessly with the press of a button. You'll only need to respawn when your entire squad is wiped out. This way, you're always kept right in the middle of the action. Although, if you prefer a more traditional shooter experience, we have a fleshed out solo mode too, where you will only fight against other players. At its core, Enlisted aims to form a golden middle ground between the more hardcore and arcade style shooters currently available. Time to kill is kept short. A bolt action rifle to the chest will down a soldier in a single shot, with submachine guns and pistols taking only a few hits. Vehicles as well can of course be devastating, but have their limitations. Aircraft are restricted to the cockpit view, and crew inside tanks can only use viewports to spot targets, so you'll need to keep your wits about you to really get the most out of these machines. Progression in Enlisted is spread over various campaigns. Currently, you can fight in Moscow, Normandy and Berlin, with Tunisia, and many more coming soon. Each campaign features new weapons and equipment. Firearms can be improved to increase their raw performance, and soldiers can be leveled up 
to grant them specialized perks. Different classes of soldiers are able to equip different gear, with specialist classes such as engineers able to build structures anywhere on the map, including fobs, sandbags and barbed wire defenses, and even anti-tank cannons and AA guns. Enlisted aims to keep historical accuracy in the forefront of development. Firearms, locations and uniforms are all true to history. No neon pink Sten guns and mohawks here. Each army will be decked out with the equipment they actually used during their respective conflicts. Because of the squads feature, you'll never be short on targets. Twitch reflexes and fast reactions will of course have their place in Enlisted, but even if you haven't had the time to fine tune your skills, you'll easily be able to come away with a kill count in the double digits. The AI, however, are very attentive and react to sound, and not to be underestimated. But that's all we've got time for. Make sure to give it a try yourself by heading over to enlisted.net slash join. Enlisted is cross-platform and available now on PC, PS5, and Xbox Series X and S, and currently in open beta. New content is added regularly, and no progress will be wiped upon the full release. Once you've signed up, use the code ENLISTNOW for a free bonus on us. I've been Tom, and I hope to see you all on the battlefield. Cheers.
Kiwi is a game about two Kiwi birds who work at the post office. Their names are Jeff and Deborah. I'm Joel, I'm one of the developers on Kiwi, and I'm going to show you how a Kiwi level changes over the course of the game. So in this room, you're transcribing urgent messages and assembling them ransom note style by stamping them onto the page with your butts. You'll come back to this room every so often throughout the game, but there will always be a new twist to change things up. So as summer turns to autumn, now your word fragments are moving around on conveyor belts, and you'll need to chop certain words in half with the descrambler to get the pieces you need. Jeff and Deborah are going to have to deal with all kinds of hazardous work conditions. They got sandstorms during the summer, male fly swarms. These guys have no respect for personal property. Paranormal activity. This is genuine footage of an actual haunting. In winter, the post office gets hit with a huge blizzard, and now this level becomes about sharing the warmth of a single tiny lantern to break through blocks of ice and keep each other from becoming peewee sickles. Our little heroes are gonna face new challenges every level and in every room of the post office, whether they're typing telegrams or packaging shipping crates or helping an octopus sort the mail. It's all in a day's work for Jeff and Deborah. Also, you can dress up your Kiwis, so don't say we never did nothing for you. We're releasing Kiwi on August 31st for PC and all major consoles, and we hope to see you at the post office. Thanks for watching. Mówi się, że to, co designerzy sobie wymyślają, to jest pisanie listu miłosnego. Każdy kiedyś był zakochany, pisał list miłosny, wydawało mu się, że to jest takie piękne, wspaniałe, a potem po latach znajdował te listy i mówił, Jezus Maria, co ja tu za bzdury pisałem. Zaczynaliśmy właściwie od gry, gdzie skupialiśmy się na przerywaniu, na menedżowaniu swoim czasem i towarzyszami. To wszystko wydawało się po designersku dobre, ale zwykle emocjonalnie dosyć nudne. I dlatego dodawaliśmy coraz więcej elementów, które angażowały gracza, które były dla niego ciekawe. Na początku był to taki mały hat, który gracz sobie mógł modyfikować, ale był całkowicie opcjonalny. Z biegiem gry on stawał się coraz bardziej sensem gry, coraz bardziej jego sercem nadawaliśmy coraz większą rolę naszym towarzyszom i warto im było dać właśnie tą walkę, coraz więcej podchowów, coraz więcej możliwości, coraz więcej broni. Absolutnie normalnym jest, że zaczyna się z czymś zupełnie innym niż to, z czym się kończy. Product not yet rated.
Four brothers, bound by eternal purpose. Alright, the Capcom show is coming up in about one minute. It's going to start real, really soon. So, just before we jump into that, we want to let you know that that's what's coming up next. So this is going to be the Capcom E3 show presentation. And we got a lot to look forward to. Capcom makes great stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's actually starting right now, so let's dive in and watch let's together. Welcome to the Capcom E3 Showcase. I'm your host, Rachel Querico, AKA Seltzer, and I'll be your guide as we walk through the latest releases, news, and updates from Capcom. We'll hear from the Resident Evil Village team, share some news from the world of Monster Hunter, and get the latest on Ace Attorney. Then we'll wrap up with some updates from our friends at Capcom Fighters. So what are we waiting for? Let's get started. Our first stop today, Resident Evil Village. The Resident Evil franchise continues to pioneer the latest and greatest in survival horror. The team has been blown away by the response to Resident Evil Village, which launched last month. It brought the world another chapter in this decades-long story as the franchise celebrates its 25th anniversary this year. I'm honored to be able to introduce Tsuyoshi Kanda, producer on Resident Evil Village, with a special message for the fans. Another time. Bye bye. There's nothing to fear. Rose! She's everything to me. I think it's time you left things in my hands. Go on, rest. Hi everyone, my name is Tsuyoshi Kanda, producer on Resident Evil Village. I wanted to take this opportunity to thank everyone who's played since we launched the game in May. We hope you're enjoying this new chapter in survival horror. As a reminder, everyone who purchases Resident Evil Village will gain free access to our online multiplayer title Resident Evil R Reverse, where players go head to head with their favorite Resident Evil heroes and bioweapons. I'm now happy to announce that Resident Evil R Reverse will go live next month across all supported platforms. So head into the fray to celebrate the Resident Evil 25th anniversary. Thank you, Kanda-san, for that wonderful update. Next up, some long-awaited news from the world of Monster Hunter. Whether it's adventuring alongside monsters or battling them with friends, we've got something for you. First, let's dive into the brand new story-based RPG entry to the series, Monster Hunter Stories 2, Wings of Ruin. This was his fate. Red may have been strong and skilled, but against the awesome power of nature, he was merely a man. 
He never stood a chance. All around, things just kept getting worse. But I heard that Guardian Ratha had survived and returned to Hekolu Island. I went there to see Red's old monster again. Then, of course, that's when I met you. You were given Red's kinship stone, and now a Rathalos egg. This is destiny. This is the legendary monster, Ray's Wing Ratha, the monster with the wings of ruin. It's said that a beat of its wings can bring about waves of destruction. Many people believe there's a connection between the strange happenings and the wings of ruin. The pits are appearing everywhere, and they're emitting a strange light. What's this whole idea of forming kinship with monsters? How do you control them? It's not about control. Monsters help riders of their own will. And the bonds between monsters and riders are just like your bond with Tsukino. What kind of power does Ratha really have? Why are all of these pits appearing? And who are those people who want to take Ratha for themselves? All I have are questions. If there's worry or doubt in your voice, Ratha will become anxious too. He needs to know that you will protect him no matter what. I can sense the flames of his life force weakening. The burden of such great power is too much for his body to bear. Can you hear it? Riders can bond with monsters. Surely you can groove with fellow humans. They have the power of kinship. They're friends. They're monsties. Humans carry the strength of everyone they meet. That makes them strong. My friends here taught me that. I believe in the strength of humanity. Looks pretty epic, right? And how about that announcement? The canine companion Palamute from Monster Hunter Rise will be joining Monster Hunter Stories 2 as one of the new Monsties in the first free title update coming soon after the game's release. You can get an early peek at the game with the Monster Hunter Stories 2 Wings of Ruin trial version starting on June 25th, which also carries your progress over to the full game release just a few weeks later on July 9th. That's not the only way to join the hunt. Millions of you made Monster Hunter Rise a huge success earlier this year, and we have even more content coming, including a new collaboration on the Rise. Let's find out more. Let's go! This is for my fellow hunters!
is no runt. Moon's blessing emerge. Get ready. I have a good feeling. What will it be? Moon's blessing emerge. Mura is like my second home. You think you can take on Rondine? There has never been a better time to be a Monster Hunter fan. With all the new updates to Monster Hunter Rise and the launch of Monster Hunter Stories 2 this summer. We can't wait to hear about your own stories of adventure. Well, that's not the only thing Capcom has in store for us this July. Fans of Phoenix Wright will have new chapters to explore with the release of the Great Ace Attorney Chronicles. North American and European future attorneys will finally be able to get their hands on the Great Ace Attorney Adventures and the Great Ace Attorney 2 Resolve, which were previously only available in Japan. You'll travel back in time to the late 19th century Japan and London to play as Ryunosuke Naruhodo, Phoenix Wright's ancestor, in this action-packed prequel. Now, let's hear more about the story. So then, let us unravel this mystery. Welcome to the center of the world. Great Britain's mighty capital, London. This country is incredible. I will become a lawyer. I have to. So then, let us unravel this mystery and discover what events led to this curious murder. Who are you? Herlock Sholmes. You must have heard of me. We must solve this case, Naruhodo-san. Let us engage in the art of deduction, Mr. Naruhodo. Well, what happened here? It would seem the truth is now tantalizingly close. The defense demands its right to a cross-examination. Objection! Your testimony completely contradicts the facts. Objection! My lord, with all due respect, this is an outrage! So we have 10 new cases and eight mini escapades where you can take on the role of a defense attorney. Now, we all wanna see some gameplay, right? Let's take a closer first look at two gameplay features new to the franchise in the Great Ace Attorney Chronicles, Dance of Deduction and Summation Examination. Hello, I'm Jonathan, Capcom's marketing brand manager for the Great Ace Attorney Chronicles. So this is the capital of Great Britain. Where to? The Supreme Court in Whitehall, if you wouldn't mind. The Capcom team is thrilled to present two new gameplay features, Dance of Deduction and Summation Examination, coming to the Ace Attorney series. While investigating to prove your client's innocence, Players will come across conspicuous situations that require further examination with the help of Ryanosuke's legal aid, Suzato, and the brilliance of deduction from Detective Herlock.
Herlock will proceed to present his logic and reasoning spectacular, a grandiose yet flawed series of conjectures. Ryunosuke and Susato will then discuss to correct the flaws in Herlock's deductions. At this point, players will be prompted to search for clues that help identify the errors in the detective's logic and reveal the truth to the mystery. As players present new evidence and observations, Herlock will amend his deductions based on the new information. Upon uncovering the truth, Ryunosuke and Herlock enter into a semi-metaphorical, semi-literal dance that brings them to the conclusion of the dance of deduction. In courtroom battles, players will attempt to convince six jurors of the innocence of their client. Their progress will be displayed and represented by two scales of justice, one black, representing a guilty verdict, and one white, representing a not guilty verdict. Objection! In summation examination, we take the stand to face off against the jurors, all of whom provide explanations as to why they've reached their guilty verdict. You'll have to identify conflicting statements and sway the jury in your favor. Examine each statement carefully and select two contradicting jurors to call out the flaws in their logic. Objection! Be ready to provide evidence from the court record to help prove the contradiction in their claims. When you successfully point out one of these contradictions among the jurors, you might just change their minds, too. With a slam of their fist, each juror you persuade will send a fiery ball towards the scales above and literally tip the scales of justice in your favor. Bring each contradiction to light and persuade the jury to help prove your client's innocence. Objection! My lord, with all due respect, this is an outrage! This has just been a small taste of the exciting new gameplay features in The Great Ace Attorney Chronicles. We are very excited to get this game in the hands of both new fans and diehard fans alike. Thanks for watching. It already seems like I have a bunch of games to catch up on. There are some exciting new adventures and titles to look forward to. Well, that's a look at the new premieres from Capcom, but what about esports? Let's close out today's showcase with a few words from two of the stars of Capcom Fighters, 
Rob TV and Vicious. They'll tell us what's been going on with Capcom Esports, including updates on the Capcom Pro Tour, Intel World Open, Street Fighter League, and all the other content on Capcom Fighters. Over to you guys. What's going on everybody and welcome to the Capcom Esports presentation for E3 2021. My name is Vicious, commentator for the Capcom Pro Tour as well as Street Fighter League, here with competitive Street Fighter V player and host extraordinaire, Hollywood, Rob TV. What's going on, Rob? Oh my goodness, Vicious, host extraordinaire. That just sounds beautiful, it has a ring to it. And I think that's the perfect word to describe what we have for everyone today. Street Fighter V, Capcom E3, it just feels right and you feel the electricity in the air. Nice! Nice! nice. What? That was nasty! And there might be some people at home, Vicious, who don't fully know what competitive Street Fighter V is. The long and the short of it is this. We travel all around the world, state to state, country to country, and we try to bring our opponent's life bar from 100 all the way down to zero and feel pretty goddamn good doing it. That's right, Rob. If you think you're the best in your region, Sign up for Capcom Pro Tour to prove it and become possibly a world champion at Street Fighter V. The double perfect. All right, so that was the Capcom show. Uh, they're still talking a little bit. They're just doing an interview with eSports, which is kind of interesting, but I want to dissect a little bit of what we saw right there. Yes. So we saw... Resident Evil. Res well, yeah, Resident Evil's already out. It's already out, but and we, we saw it. <laughs> saw it. Uh, Monster Hunter Stories 2. Yep. Monster Hunter Rise. Mm -hmm. And Ace Attorney. Yes. So the bulk of that section was Monster Hunter Stories 2, a game that neither of us are familiar with. We haven't played the Stories 1. No, but this looked interesting. It looked like it, there was a pretty compelling story there. It did. It looked pretty cool. Uh, really, an really good anime style, if you like that kind of art aesthetic. Yeah. Uh, I played Monster Hunter World a fair bit. Uh, that was a lot of fun. I play Dauntless with my family sometimes, and they really mm -hmm. enjoy that. Just taking on giant monsters. They yeah. really like that. It's a fun time. Now, Ace Attorney is not a game I've played. I've known about it for a long time. I've never played it myself, but that looked like a lot of fun. It did. Not going to lie. That would actually be pretty fun to play. At first, I thought it was a little bit silly. Uh, <laughs> it's especially because the name is uh, Herlock Sholmes. Herlock Sholmes, all the way. Holmes. Yep. Uh, but the silliness kind of uh, draws you in, and it and you, it grows on you. So it's like, all right, I could have some fun with this. Yeah, and what Capcom showed there, I really liked because they showed us a little bit of cinematic. Mm -hmm. Then they showed us two new features that are inside of this game because there've been a lot of games in this series, but they actually showed us gameplay and yeah. what it looks like, which has been lacking in a lot. In my eyes, so. If you were to hear about a game that you were interested in, what is your ideal trailer that you'd want to actually see from them? Like, what would be the perfect trailer that would give you exactly what you're looking for? So, for me, it would depend on the genre. Um, but what always, I, I think a, a constant for me is, is a compelling story. Like, a good story for whatever the game would be. Whether it be a first-person shooter, um, or an RPG, or even something like a mystery game. So if there's, a, if there's a good story, I can sometimes look past the gameplay. Okay. So you want a focus on the cinematics and the narrative that you're going to be getting into. Yes. So the gameplay itself is not as important to the you. The gameplay is important depending on what the genre is. So like if it's something that involves a lot of moving around and stuff, so like a shooter or even an MMO, I want to have fluid gameplay where it's not going to be crazy to like switch guns Hashtag Resident Evil 4. Uh, <laughs> you know, I want something that's, that's a lot more fluid. Um, but, I mean, there's some RPGs, like, if you think back to, like, um, Final Fantasy, Final Fantasy X, where it was turn-based, you uh, set up, you know, what your party's um, weapons are, what their skills are and everything, and then you just kind of wander until the game randomly spawns you into a battle. Yeah. So, for that one... Yeah, the combat system was kind of fun. It was, you know, it's a turn-based combat system. It's different, but it had a very good, compelling story that made it okay sometimes to just, to get from point A to point B, you have to go through, like, sometimes 20 to 30 battles. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense, depending on what you're looking for. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I think for me, a good trailer is going to have, 
I really liked Freedom Games Showcase. So they had the yes. developer, the reason behind they were making the game. A little, little bit from the developer's perspective, I liked that. And then a little bit of cinematics, but I want to see more gameplay. I want to see what I'm actually going to be doing. Because I enjoy a good story as well. But to me, the story, like that, that's a fairly minimal part of the game. Unless it's a really big narrative game. You're going to spend a lot more time doing the combat, exploration, puzzles, whatever it is. Yeah. So I want to make sure that that looks and feels good. Watching the Ace Attorney trailer there... Like, if that's actually how it plays out, because they said it was gameplay. Mm -hmm. Now, I didn't see a UI or a menu selection, but it looked like it was fun. It looked entertaining. And if it's actually that quick and fast-paced, then that's great. Yeah. Now, I'm, I'm still a little, little skeptical there, because we didn't see the UI. And when we don't see a UI, it's usually pre-generated, not actual gameplay. Yeah. But that kind of trailer, I think, really hits home for me, and that's definitely um, what is the most fun. Just to pointed out i believe that the great ace attorney is a game that was available in japan and it's just coming to the uk and america uh, okay now so it is a game that has been out for a while just not in our region okay okay i know there's a lot of great ace attorneys so there was uh so although resident evil came out i think what they said like a month ago about a month yeah. they did say that there was a multiplayer that was going to be coming out either this later this month or next month yeah re verse Tyrion, see if you can find a trailer for re verse and pull that up so it's just an online resident evil multiplayer it looks mm -hmm. like a third person shooter yep. where you, did, did i see that right that you could play as the zombies it looked like you could probably do both or you can do like a pve where you're versus the zombies but i saw some uh what looked like Resident Evil characters that you could play as. Um, I think I saw someone who kind of looked like Leon Kennedy, but it was kind of from the back. I think I saw Claire Redheart. Is that her yeah. name? Yeah. I think I, they're, I think they're bringing in the iconic characters that you can play as. That's what I've heard about it. Do you, you find anything yet? I don't know if they uh, have I anything. I found a 49-second teaser trailer and a few instances of early, uh, like, beta gameplay. Put on that teaser trailer. Let's take a look at that together. Okay. So this is for RE Verse, which is a new Resident Evil PvP, I think, online only game. Let's take a look at this. Because this could be a lot of fun. Okay, yeah. So PvP online only humans and zombies. Yeah, that looks kind of fun. Uh, I think they showed almost nothing about it in the Capcom trailer there, which is really surprising if it's launching next month, right? Yeah. One month away, you'd expect them to have more of a teaser for it than what they showed. Just a few seconds. It was just a few clips, uh, and then it was like, I guess, I think the lead developer guy talking, saying, hey, we got this thing coming out, here's what you can do, and, and that was basically it. Yeah, you get it for free if you purchase Resident Evil 7, right? Run Village, V-I-I-7. So that's at least something. Mm -hmm. That seems to be a pretty well. Okay, so the verse is not completely free. Like Halo Infinite multiplayer will be completely free. Yeah, but it's still a step in the right direction, I guess. Well, it's a very interesting turn for uh, the franchise because for the longest time, uh, I think up until Resident Evil Five, where they go to South Africa, you were just playing solo by yourself. And five, they introduced co-op. Mm -hmm. And I think six is also co-op as well. Yeah. So, they're bringing in more multiplayer, more ways to play together, mm -hmm. and it seems to be a trend for quite a while now that the multiplayer aspect of games are standalone. All right, Red Dead Redemption. Yep. Uh, going to be Halo. Mm -hmm. You've got Call of Duty, which, I mean, Warzone is its own thing, but then you can play those. You can download all of Call of Duty, and then you can play at least Warzone for free, if not also. Can you play Call of Duty multiplayer for free? Like the just the PvP? I don't think you can. I don't know. If I you believe can. it's just Warzone. Just Warzone. So they yeah. but they, they are making modes available for free. 
Yeah. Which I think is a good thing. More options. And then, you know, thinking back to Rockstar, I think even, I think it was GTA Five that had an online platform you could play with other people and just wreak havoc across the city. Yeah. GTA Five for the last decade. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So coming up next on E3 is the Razer presentation. Now, Razer is a sponsor of theirs. You can see it if you just look for two seconds at their stream. They've got Razer laptops, Razer seats, uh, headrests. Didn't even know they made those. Uh... I am not expecting much from the Razer presentation, so we're going to loop some trailers that we've had. We're going to put the rest of the Capcom trailers in there. We're just going to loop all the trailers that have been playing at E3 for a little while. And if we see something really interesting on the Razer stream, then we'll, we'll add it in and take a look at it. But I am not expecting anything new. In fact, Tyrion, let's go ahead and cut to it and take a look at it and see what Razer's going to have, and we'll just know right away. So they've got it up. Here now, Razor's gonna start. Biggest Let's watch this together and see if this is gonna be any interesting. I've got an insane show for everyone today. We have come a long way here together, all gamers by gamers, and today we're one of the biggest gaming brands in the world. We span hundreds of millions of gamers from PC gaming to console gaming to mobile gaming. But what I'd like to talk a little bit about today to kick things off is PC gaming, something near, dear, close to my heart. And Oh, all right. We lost the stream. We'll be back in just a moment. Sometimes you got to refresh it because the stream is not appropriate for all ages. <laughs> all right. So Razer looks like they're doing an overview of Super thick, super heavy. their laptops and, the and PC gaming. The true gaming laptop in the sense it was yeah. super thick, super light, and okay. super powerful. And it ushered in a new generation of gaming laptops. And since then, over the past 10 years, the entire industry has moved to follow in the footsteps of the Razer Blade. In 2013, we launched the world's thinnest gaming laptop. 2016, we invented the world's first Thunderbolt 3 external GPU. In 2018, we launched the world's smallest 15-inch gaming laptop. And since oh, yeah. then, We've now got the entire Razer <laughs> We've got the Blade Self 13. We've got the Blade Pro 17. And of course, we've got the Blade 15. And the Razer Blade has been both a critical and commercial success. It's been called the very best gaming laptop in the world and continues to win accolades over and over again. And at this point, Many of our fans, many of the Razer community is asking, what's next? So we go down and we talk to every single one of our fan base, for gamers, by gamers, we talk to the press. And one thing that we've heard consistently over the past couple of years is when is Razer going to make an AMD gaming laptop? Well, Ladies and gentlemen, I'm incredibly excited to be able to announce that we're now working closely together with AMD, and we've put the very best designers and engineers together with the top AMD engineers, and what we've created in a single line is the ultimate AMD gaming laptop. And with that, we are bringing back the legendary Razer Blade 14. How do we do this? How did we make the ultimate AMD gaming laptop? Well, we took a look at the 14-inch gaming laptops today. Now, many of them have tried to follow in the footsteps of the Blade 14 that we created some 10 years ago, and many things have changed since then. In terms of form factor, many of the gaming laptops out there are portable, but what we feel they could be thinner, could be slimmer, now, over and above, in terms of GPUs, there's been not much innovation. Don't get me wrong, they've got a great GPU in there, but they maxed out at a RTX 3060. In fact, in terms of total graphics power, or TGP, they maxed out at just 80 watts. And we feel it could go much higher, with, of course, the right materials, and with, of course, the right cooling thermal solutions. 
now as we talk about materials. Unfortunately, most of them still use really non-premium builds. Now, one thing that we do at Razer that all of you are familiar with is that we look at doing really premium builds. We've got CNC'd machined um, uh, chassis. We want to make sure that you've got the best possible no-flex kind of a chassis, but many of the ones out there don't have that. And of course, cooling. Many of the 14-inch gaming laptops are still using solutions that we pioneered some 10 years ago. At Razer, we've really pushed it ahead. We've had vapor chamber cooling for years now. We are in the next generation of that. We've done that for laptops. We've done that for phones over and over. Now, in terms of having all this last-gen tech, many of them are still limited in terms of the ports that they've got. They've got only a couple of Type A ports, a couple of Type C ports, so on and so forth. And they've got truly, truly uninspired keyboards. They're using single color backlit keyboards. Why? Because they don't have space. All right, so Razer's going over their history and they're talking about a new partnership with AMD. AMD is pretty big right now, both in CPU and GPU. They're taking the market lead. They've got better prices, performance, architecture, just pretty much everything. So it's great that they're coming out with an AMD laptop, but this is not gaming necessarily. Like, yeah, it's a gaming laptop, which is great, but it's going to be, my guess would be minimum 1500 to get into this all the way up to 3000 or more. Minimum with like the lowest specs. Lowest specs. I mean, their lowest specs that are going to be great. Don't get yeah. me wrong. Razer does make good products. I've used some of their stuff in the past. It it's good, it's clean, and but it's pricey. It's a premium. Razer is very much a premium laptop. But we're gonna check it out for you. Uh, I think this is a great place to just we're gonna kill it here. We'll watch what they've got, give you a recap tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning is gonna be our last day streaming. We're gonna start around 8:30, 9 o'clock. Nintendo has their premiere at 9 o'clock, so be sure to tune in then. Nintendo, we're hoping, is going to have a great stream. Yes. They should have a lot of new stuff to announce, hopefully some premieres, and it's going to be it's going to be a lot of fun. So we're going to watch that, and then that's going to be the end of our stream, so make sure you tune in, and... We'll see you next time. We'll see you next time.